There they are. Okay. Okay, Mr. Marshall. We are good to go. You are a co-host. Amherst Media has successfully joined the meeting. Um, you have a quorum. It's 6.33 when you're ready. Great. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of June 29th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.34 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the, of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the, planning, on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. We will post an audio or video Oh, I'm sorry, in the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship, or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and return to mute. Maria Chow. Uh -huh. uh, we know Jack Jemsek will be absent this evening. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Uh, we were informed this afternoon that Janet McGowan will be absent this evening. And Johanna Newman. Present. Thank you. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remute, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general comment period. Public comment can also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a phone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, so our first item this evening is uh, approval of minutes. And I believe this afternoon, uh, Chris, you sent out draft minutes for our June 15th meeting. And uh, Board members, uh, if you have had a chance to review those, we can vote on those this evening. Um, could I have a just a, a brief raise hand uh, from board members if you've read the minutes that we're that we're going to approve? Well, I see at least three. Uh, I don't see that Tom or Andrew have read those. All right. 
Um, however, Tom and Andrew, oh, okay, Tom, you yeah. raised your hand. Yeah, we were we were not there, so we might yeah. abstain on that anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, Chris, is there any problem with three of us approving minutes? That would be a majority of the members present this evening. That's correct, yep. Okay, good. All right. Um, Johanna. Thanks. I had just um, a couple of like little typo things in the minutes. I don't, how important is it that we fix those? Like it doesn't affect the comprehension of them, but it does just make them look tidier. Well, sure. if you found some things, uh, you could tell us what they are okay. or, or you could, you know, if there's 25 of them, you could send them to Chris. There are three little things, Pam. All right. So, uh -oh. <laughs> the first is on the board members present. There are just a lot of extra commas there. I think probably where names were copied and pasted. Um, on page seven, there is an extra space in the second line after the 826 public comment. And then on page eight, um, there's a typo in Janet McGowan's kind of initial response on board discussion about special permits. Those are the three things. Other than that, I think the minutes look great and would uh, be happy to make a motion to approve with those edits as suggested. All right, why don't you do that? I'd like to move to approve the minutes from June 15th as um, amended. All right, uh, Maria. Second. Thank you. Any further board conversation about that? Not seeing any. All right, um, so we'll go through the roll call. Maria? Approve. Uh, Tom? Abstain. And Andrew? Abstain. Uh, I'm an approve. And Johanna? Approve. All right, the motion carries three in favor, two abstentions and no uh, nays. All right, so the time now is 6.40, and we'll go to the second item on the agenda. Uh, that is public comment period. So I will remove, re remind all the public that this is uh, the time for comments on, for items that are not on our agenda. So anything related to the dog park or 446, to 462 Main Street. Those comments should be held until later in the meeting. Are there any public members who would like to make comments at this time? Please raise your hand if you, if you would. All right, I see one uh, hand from Hilda Greenbaum. Hilda, if you would give us your name and your and your yeah, Hilda Greenbaum, two ninety eight Montague Road. I just wanted to say that Amherst Media is not recording tonight, unless they're recording from Town Hall. They're not on the TV. If anybody is looking for it to tape it or something, they're not playing tonight. Okay. They're at least probably up as of today. But I just thought I would mention that in case somebody's confused. Okay, thank you, Hilda. Pam, do you, do you want to pause and communicate with them? I, I'm going to reach out to them right now. Yeah. Because my impression is they are here. I do see them in the panelists. They are in the panelists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the TV isn't working. I tried it on both TVs and it's they're off the air. It may be a Comcast issue. Uh, so, okay. So Amherst Media says that, no, we're moving and we will be off the air. It's um, on our website. They're live on YouTube. Oh, okay. Okay. So other people, other people will know that too. Then That was probably good. I told you. Thank you. Yeah, I did not know. I knew they were here, but I didn't know that there was um, um, a discrepancy in, in being on YouTube versus TV. Thank All you, right. Hilda. 
So thank you, Hilda. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to make a comment? I do not see any. All right. So it's time now is 6.43 and we'll move on to item three, the first of our public hearings. <clears throat> so in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding Site Plan Review 2022-15, Town of Amherst Dog Park at 95 Old Belchertown Road. Request Site Plan Review approval to amend the previously approved site plan, which was SPR 2019-06, to revise the site layout, grading and drainage plans, to revise the kiosk plan, to reduce the number of parking spaces, to request a zoning bylaw section 7.9 waiver to modify the length of parking spaces and a section 8.5 waiver to modify the size and number of signs. Parcel located on, on map 21B, parcel eight, in the PRP zoning district. Are there any board member disclosures? All right. Um, Chris, uh, or maybe Nate, do you wanna make the presentation for the town? Nate will make the presentation. <clears throat> sure, thanks hi everyone. I'm Nate Malloy, our planner with the town. I'm bringing the dog park back to the planning board. So it was reviewed and approved um, almost two years ago. Uh, site plan review. And so during construction, there were some changes made. Um, I'd call them in the field adjustments, but there was a number of little changes that added up to, um, you know, I don't want to say significant, but more than de minimis in the, you know, opinion of the building commissioner and staff. So we want to bring it back to the planning board for review. Um, I'll share my screen and I can, you know, I'll, I'll share the plan, the updated need, plan. Before you go into the design, I was wondering if you could explain why you're coming to us now as opposed to before the changes were constructed. It's a really great question. <laughs> no, I, um, you know, once it was under construction, uh, Public Works, the town engineer and staff worked with the contractors, um, you know, to, to make amendments to the plan. Uh, and the dog, there's a dog park task force as well um, that had some input. And so I think there was just, you know, I don't think there was a realization that the changes were happening um, and that they needed to be approved. So, um, you know, when we originally came to the planning board, there was an assumption uh, on this plan, there's a, a thick dotted line and that's where the limit of the clay cap. So this is over the old, um, essentially the old dump. Uh, you know, it, it's over where they used to have the um, stump dump uh, and where they put organic material. So anyways, when we when, when this was first presented, the uh, extent of the cap wasn't uh, known, uh, nor was the depth of it. So the depth from the topsoil. So while they, as construction was starting, they realized that the cap extended closer to the road and was you know six to eight inches closer to the surface, in some places maybe more than what was anticipated. So Public Works ended up digging um, a few dozen um, test pits, you know, hand holes to determine where the clay cap was to get a, a sense for it in this whole area. And that's something that hadn't been done beforehand. So I think if, you know, if, if that was done beforehand, these plans would have been adjusted before the planning board, um, you know, before the initial review. And so, you know, when that was happening, I don't think it, there was an awareness that it needed to come back. Um, it was just something that they, you know, they accommodated what was in the field and made changes. So is this the kind of thing that always happens on projects and it's not unusual for a project of, to come back to us after construction for retroactive approval? I don't say it's, um, you know, I guess it's, the, you know, the question is, you know, how uh, substantially similar or dissimilar is this to the original plan? And so I think the, building commissioner really thought that uh, what was unique is that there's a loss of parking spaces 
Uh, and some of the parking spaces are now shorter than the 18 feet, which is a standard depth um, in there. And, um, you know, that there's proposed signs and that, you know, that, you know, the number and size of the signs may need to come back. So it wasn't necessarily that, you know, for instance, the walkways change and other things, and those would be considered in the field adjustments that would be recorded on, on as builds that would come back to the uh, inspection services and, you know, be on file with the town and, and public works. And so I think it's really the parking spaces um, and the signs that, you know, were reason why it's coming back. You know, the loss of parking space is not that there was adjustments to some of the elements in the plan. Okay. Thank and you. so if we, Chris has her hand up. Sure, Chris. Oh, I just wanted to note that usually on um, projects, uh, we have our inspectors out um, inspecting projects while they're being built and making sure they're built according to the plans. And I think in this case, inspectors weren't there. There's no building. And um, it was left up to DPW to, um, you know, monitor what was going on. And, and that's why it's kind of a, I, sh I guess it was something that slipped through the cracks, the fact that these changes needed to come back to the planning board. Thanks, Chris. I, I think the main reason I'm kind of asking about this is whether we as, as the town, as the constructor of this, are giving ourselves sort of a pass or treating ourselves more leniently than we would treat someone who's in a, you know, a private project. Right. I, mean, I will say that I, I wasn't aware necessarily that these changes were made until they were already done. So, you know, we had a, a meeting and then there was some discussion uh, and then, you know, we had an on-site visit after and um, the building commissioner went out there as well and said, wow, this is different. And so it wasn't something that you know, perhaps if it was discussed beforehand, maybe it would have come back. Um, okay, well, let's go yeah. on and let's hear what, what, what happened. Sure, so I'm gonna, I'll, I think I'm gonna annotate this as we're going, just so it's easier to see uh, where I'm discussing. If, if, if the plan is, is it visible or legible enough? I can zoom in a bit. If, um, in any event, the, there's a, a berm here an existing curb uh, that remained. And so the parking spaces went on this side of it. So originally this berm was gonna be removed, but the, the, the cap, this dotted line extends much further out than we thought. And so, and it's higher. And so um, the decision was made not to, not to dig into this area and make it level with the road right now because we would get too low to the cap. And so, um, because of that, these parking spaces are, um, some of them are, you know, 17 feet, nine inches, uh, 17 feet, you know, six inches. Uh, the handicapped spaces are still a full, a full depth, but, you know, these parking spaces, um, some are 18, but some of them are not. And so that, you know, that's a change. Um, this entryway right here, originally this, this wasn't here. Originally the sidewalk was going to come straight across. But with the, the change in the depth here, um, the, the handicap spaces are offset and now there's a, a curb ramp here to get up onto the sidewalk area. So originally the handicap spaces were right dead center with the gate and they were shifted over to accommodate uh, grading and elevation. Um, also on the plan, originally there was five additional parking spaces in this location and they were um, eliminated again, because of the cap and the possibility of moving a hydrant. And so there's no uh, specific requirement for number of parking spaces for a park. And so uh, currently there's 17 spaces proposed, including two handicap. And so, um, you know, staff thinks that's still enough to, um, to accommodate the dog park. Um, you know, the other changes are the, the fence here, um, the perimeter fence along the, the outside has a concrete uh, base. It has a ballast that runs along the fence. It's essentially at grade. It's a visible in a few spots. Uh, for instance, right here, might be two or three inches um, above grade, but the fence posts couldn't be buried deep enough to secure them. And so, and much of the fence, there is now a concrete footing, a continuous footing, and the fence posts are actually then cored into the concrete 
and set into the concrete for stability. Um, and the shape of these internal walkways. So these are internal walkways and these, these are shade structures. So originally, you know, the shapes of these were slightly different and the location of the shade, stru shade structures were moved to accommodate, you know, change in topography and drainage. So, you know, this shade structure here was originally over here where the boulders are. And this one was also in a different location. And so to keep the pass accessible and working with the grade, you know, those, um, the shape of that path has changed. Um, and the location of the perimeter fence, um, you know, was moved a bit again, just to work with topography and drainage. So, you know, I think those are, those are the changes The you know, the big one is then now that these parking spaces are not, don't meet the nine by 18, um, you know, standard size of a parking space. And Nate, uh, the berm that you mentioned first, Yes. Does that mean there's a grade change between the road and to drive into the parking spaces? Right. So if this, you know, this is the road, there's a little bit of a lip and then the parking space is like this. So there is a, a transition area. It was eliminated for the handicap spaces and the access aisle. And what happened is the, the, the pavement then extends into the roadway a little bit like this, there's a, you know, a transition area. And so instead of having this, extend the whole way into the roadway it's really only happening here so there is a little bit of a transition area um, between the parking and the road okay thank you and i think the the goal would be to when old Belchertown road is repaved there's also some puddling in the road not not because of this project but um you know when Belchertown road would be old Belchertown road is repaved then this would be ad adjusted so the road itself would probably be brought up a little bit to make these spaces um, more consistent with the grade. All right. Um, so th those are the site changes. Um, I, was, I was, you know, I guess if I, if we moved around, for instance, you know, this perimeter fence originally, there was another vertex here. So it, it came out and then, you know, had a little bit different of a perimeter line. Um, um, I think that's really about it. Um, the irrigation system changed. It actually, originally we thought we might have to run power to the site, um, electrical power and have a meter. And we found, I think it was a town engineer found a, um, an irrigation system that runs off solar. And it's actually has a very small footprint. It's a, it's probably like an eight by 10 box. And the solar panel is only about five inches by five inches on top. And it uses water pressure from the water line uh, and then a really small pump and timer just to, it runs one uh, head at a time, but it can irrigate the site without electricity and without um, a, a typical irrigation pump. So it saves on electricity and um, probably water as well. Um, I was gonna just go over the signs. And so I guess I'll annotate again. So the, 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 the dog park task force has come up with um, a series of signs. They'd like a rules and regulation sign, an etiquette sign, a welcome sign, and then possibly a freestanding sign to the site. And so, um, and then there's a kiosk. And, uh, you know, there's this main fence here and there's a vestibule as you enter. And so the idea is to have a rules and regulation sign here, an etiquette sign here so that they're as you walk in, you see uh, those types of signs. They would like a, um, a welcome to the dog park sign on the fence here. And then there's an entry kiosk that'll be here um, that I'll show an image of. And the idea then would to also be have a freestanding sign somewhere along the road, old Belchertown Road. I'm not sure the exact location, you know, something like this. So someone driving would see it, um, you know, at, at the site visit, you know, it was, it was discussed that, you know, would it almost be better to have the sign closer to Belchertown Road? Because if you're, uh, as you're, if you're already here, you probably are aware that there's a dog park. So I'm not, you know, there can be some discussions about that sign. Um, in terms of what they look like, I guess I have to delete my annotation. It still stays, I move, I move. all right.
So the rules and regs, um, you know, and I, I had emailed the board. Um, so this is something that the dog park task force came up with. I'm trying to zoom out so it's all visible. So they, you know, they would want this sign on one side of the entry gate. Um, you know, they're envisioning it as a four foot by four foot sign. And so there's rules about, um, you know, just the hours and, and what not to do. Uh, there's an etiquette sign, which is more about the behavior of dogs. And so the dog park, you know, has a, an, two areas, one's for a small dog and one's for a large dog. And so most dog parks have some delineation or some distinction between that so that you know, here it's 30 pounds. So dogs under 30 pounds and dogs over 30 pounds. Um, and it has, you know, what's expected of behavior of the dogs. So those are two signs that would be near the entry gate. Um, the idea is to have a, four, uh, a kiosk uh, that's actually an eight sided kiosk. And um, it would be the same one as at Groff Park. And so I think that's probably easier if I just show the images of of that. And so here's, here's actually the kiosk installed at Groff Park. And um, you said eight sided? Well, the display area. So, you know, there's oh. inside, you know, it's a, you know, if you typically you, would, you could say it's a four sided kiosk, but there's, you know, two sides in each, um, you know, two each panels. corner. And so what it looks like is something like this. It's about two feet by four feet. And um, you know, and from a distance, it looks, you know, you can't, you can't really see that it's, you know, two different planes, but, um, the idea for the kiosk is to have the list of donors, um, have a map, uh, and then, you know, some of it might be actually spaces for, um, you know, community postings or other information because the rules, the idea is to have the rules and rules and the, um, etiquette on the, on the fence. Uh, and then back to the final sign is a welcome sign. And they're, they're calling this a temporary sign, but I think it would be something similar. So they would like a larger sign, um, kind of in a banner format that would be on the fence and also um, incorporated into a freestanding sign. Uh, Nate, this said it was temporary. Right. Uh, it, is this the same as the permanent one? It's a good question. Um, I only know it labeled as temporary uh, in part because it's been printed on a piece of plastic uh, that's you know on the site now just as a temporary sign. So although it's labeled temporary, um, I mean, I'm, I was told that these other signs are final and that this one, not final, but you know, the language and the design is final. And I'm assuming that this is the same, that it's pretty near final in terms of what, you know, what would be, going to production, um, you know, subject to comments by the planning board. And this is going to the design review board in July. So it's not as if they would just completely change the design. You know, this is something that is in draft form and, you know. So if I have a dog, if I have two dogs, one of which is over 30 pounds and one of which is under, mm -hmm. do I have to make two separate trips or leave one dog in the car? Geez, that's a really good question. There's the, yeah, that's a good question. The, um, you know, there's this entry vestibule here within the park. And so it may be that you'd have to leave one dog there or if the dog can be under voice control that you could be on one side uh, and the other dog could be on the other, so. Okay. All right, so that's your presentation. Um, why don't we hear the site visit report? Um, who was who was present at the site visit? Tom, you. How about you? Sure, I I agreed to do this since uh, it's Maria's last meeting. She doesn't need to do a report. Um, so um, we uh, Maria, myself, and uh, Chris arrived, and Nate uh, was there as well to sort of give us a tour. Um, I will say that um, from the outset, we were all just standing on this entryway. So um, on the uh, 
outside of the dog park, which appeared to be locked at the time. So we were just on the um, in the entryway or on the patio. What do you call it? The I don't know the the sidewalk right by the parking area. Um, and Nate pretty much walked us through all of those things that he discussed, like on site. So you know, pointing towards um, where the signage is going to go, where the um, foundation for the um, the fence is going, uh, where that is visible. Um, he pointed out where the kiosk is going to be located. There are markings on the ground for that, um, so we can get a sense of where that was. Um, we were able to see the parking that you're referring to, Doug, the, the little bump up, which actually wasn't a really big deal when you're on site and you're pulling into a parking spot. Um, it's really no different than some of the things you'd experience in a you know, downtown parking area. Um, and um, we also, there are also some significant sized cars. I mean, I have a medium SUV and it fit just fine in the spot and there didn't seem like there are any big, big problems. And I think, you know, we just were discussing the six or eight inches that are shorter on some of them. Um, Nate talked to us about where the cap was and how that actually did affect all these changes. And that really was about um, the fact that we couldn't dig into the site in all of these different locations that caused the shift of the parking and caused the shift of the entryway um, to be moved over from in front of the handicapped area um, and the change in the shape of the plan of the parks and the location of the covers and thing, uh, the shelters and things like that. So, um, I mean, that was pretty much it. It was really just, you know, we were kind of sitting in, I was standing in one spot, kind of going over all of those things. I think one of the things that we paid a bit of attention to, um, which we'll probably get to a little bit today is the signage. Um, that the this we discussed the scale of the sign is a four by four, um, but also the proximity with which you would view it and whether or not it needed to be quite so large to actually view it and how big the type might need to be. So um, that might be something we want to discuss that um, no one's going to be viewing the sign from really far away because you can't really get that far away from it. So, you know, you'll probably be pretty close as you enter the dog park. So the type doesn't need to be huge and the sign may not need to be huge either, but we're able to kind of visually um, measure that and, and get a sense of what might be necessary there. Um, but I think that's pretty much it um, from our view, but we're there for about 20 to 30 minutes um, going over all the details. All right, thanks, Tom. Uh, okay, time for questions from the board, Johanna. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry I missed the site visit, but I did have a chance to go today and look at the site and that coupled with Nate's presentation, I think give me a pretty good sense. Um, I have two questions. So my, well, three questions. So my first is why, why were we not able to push the park up more onto the old dump? Because it seems like if the, I understand that we can't dig into the cap, but I don't understand why we couldn't just, you know, nudge it up five or 10 feet um, from the road to preserve the original design and why all these changes were needed. So that's the first question. My second question is, I noticed that there were two gravel areas and I think the plan only denotes one. So um, Nate, I don't know if you can talk a little bit to the two gravel areas and what benefits having gravel areas offers the dog park. Um, and then my third question has to do with the signing um, because I feel like when we were reviewing the signage for Kendrick Park, and some of the wayfinding signs, there were, there was a very clear uniform standard that we were hoping to bring kind of all the signs in Amherst into. And I just wanna verify, these signs look a little bit different than those. And I wanna see if there isn't an opportunity to sync it up. Um, and then my last thought on signage, and maybe we'll come back to it, so there might be more thoughts is um, once you're on old Belchertown Road, it'll be obvious that there's a dog park there. So in my mind, the signage 
in an ideal world, there would be some kind of presence on Route 9 to notify people of its existence. All That's right. all I have. Nate, do you have some responses to those? Sure. The, I'll share my screen again. I think the um, one of the reasons, well, there's a few reasons why we couldn't push the park into the, the transfer station or the old transfer station is that um, the area beyond the fence is habitat for, um, for a, a grasshopper sparrow, which is a threatened species. And so we needed to maintain that field. Um, and then I was also just going to say that it's, it's uphill. So here's the grading plan. So this becomes a pretty steep hill here. So to push it into the, the site would, you know, um, would actually make it more difficult because um, we couldn't excavate at all on the site. You could only scrape the grass. I mean, they were, it was DEP, Mass DEP had actually thought about not even removing, letting you remove grass, just mowing it and letting, you know, keeping the roots there. So they didn't, they almost didn't want any removal of topsoil. So that made it really difficult to, to change location. Um, um, so that's that one. Um, oh, in terms of the gravel area, so the plan, the plan always had two gravel areas. So within the walkways here, there's keystone. And so yeah, maybe it wasn't shown clearly, but um, originally as, you know, as it was permitted, and then as it was built, there's always two, there's, there's a gravel area in each dog section and a grassy area. And um, most of the funding for this park came from the Stanton Foundation. It's a private foundation that funds a few different um, um, priorities. And one is, is um, dog parks, it's canine health, but they recommend Peastone as a surface just for, uh, it's easy to clean um, and the dogs can, can use it. Um, and it doesn't get eroded like grass. So oftentimes if you have a, a grass surface here, um, it requires more maintenance in terms of just maintaining lawn and turf so it doesn't erode. Um, and so this gra these gravel areas were put in there um, just for that purpose, you know, just as a, you know, easier maintenance, the dogs tend to use it and, um, you know, and it's recommended as one of the top three surfaces for a dog park. Uh, and with the signs, your comments on the signs, I think that's something that the board can discuss. Um, you know, Chris and I had talked about having a condition that, you know, the signs come back to the planning board before, um, you know, being produced and made. So, um, I think there can be some discussion about location and, and right uh, size of the signs. All right. Thanks, Nate. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Nate. A um, couple of quick ones. One, I would, I would uh, just plus one what Johanna said about signage on Route 9, if possible. I think that would be huge. I, I, um, I stopped by the site today also. Uh, sorry, I missed the site visit. And I, I, I wouldn't have known that it was there because uh, I would have no reason to go on that road um, unless I was trying to get into Amherst Woods in the, in the back way. Um, I had a question on the rule sign, also in terms of standards is, would it, we've got like a private email address on there. And is that something that we've done in the past? We would do, that seems like it's out of place to have, um, have people sending emails to a, to a Gmail account. If you have questions, because I imagine many people would probably do that instead of picking up the phone. Um, and so I would think that that would be a town address if we have one on there at all, um, instead of Amherst Dog Park at gmail.com. I don't know. Thanks, uh, Andrew. Good point. So, yeah, the, the Dog Park Task Force is, you know, there's going to be a friends group that will be, you know, maintaining it and also uh, perhaps responding. But I think to your point, we could have a you know, we've done in the past for other things, we've set up a, you know, a could be a town email that is just rerouted to an email, but at least that it's a, you know, a same, the same format. So we're not, you know, it's not going to an email that could change. You know, we could set it up to an Amherst ma.gov email that we have control of. Um, yeah, cool. I, I, I think that'd be a, a, a really good idea. Mm -hmm. And I just, I had to follow up. You mentioned the five parking spaces. I have no idea whether 17, is enough spaces or not. I imagine if it's not, people are just gonna park on the street. Um, when I was looking at the previously approved plan, it looked like there was an allowance for that fire hydrant. And it seemed like those five spaces are actually kind of further away from the cap, where it seems as though from my reading and, and what I understand you said, they actually could go there. 
Um, I, I'm not advocating that you do that now. Um, again, not knowing what the capacity would look like, but it seems to me like it actually was was called for and um, and accounted for in that in that uh, page we got in our packet that said previously proved in 2019. Yeah, I'll share my screen. I think the 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 um... do you, do you have the 2019 version handy? Oh, I, I, if it's in the packet, I think what happened though is that the caps here and the sidewalk is here to push the the parking spaces here would make it difficult to then have a continuous sidewalk got have it. the right got grade it, it. because the cap is so high. So okay, all right, I missed on the sidewalk piece. So, that makes more sense now. So to have you know five spaces here, right? Would just, um, but okay, all right. Thanks for clarifying that. Right, there was an island for the hydrant. I think there was some concern though about if we, if you're paving it, you know, and we were putting parking spaces there, if it was disrupted, where would it go? But uh, Johanna had mentioned the package of town signs we saw yes. probably a year ago and um, questioned why these signs don't look more like the standards that the town is trying to implement. So I wondered if you could come back to that. Sure, I think that's a really good point. Um, some of it is the, the task force helped uh, develop these signs. And so I think, I actually think that's a really good recommendation. So, you know, whether it's um, the same, you know, the same font, uh, you know, whether the, um, you know, motif of the logo or something, you know, I think there, I agree that some similarities would, um, you know, be good uh, to have some, you know, some consistency. So I think the, the idea was to not always use the exact same format for conservation areas, recreation areas, but to take, you know, some of the, uh, the themes of the signs and carry them through. And so um, I just think that hasn't been done yet or verified that it is, so. Yeah, we also reviewed the signs at the parking area on Bay Road that led to the conservation area. Right. And you know, this feels like more like a conservation area that you'd go for a walk. This, yeah. this time you'll take your dog and let it off leash. <laughs> so, uh, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Doug and, and Nate. I think, um, I think I agree with that. And I, I know that the standards are made for a reason. And I think we should double check these with those standards. I think the other thing um, in terms of the signage that we're missing is um, seeing them at scale on the fence, right? So in an elevation, I mean, I know they're not, um, they're not there. So I'd like to see the, that presentation, mm -hmm. um, so whether it's a sign schedule or elevations before we approve that. And that might give us an opportunity to rethink the scale of some of these and, and some of those graphics to build some more consistency. Um, I do think it's fine to have the temporary sign. I think that some kind of temporary information about, um, you know, uh, etiquette and rules would be really helpful if we are opening before permanent signs are installed. Um, but I do think before those permanent signs go up, I'd like to see them in context and um, have them match the standards a little bit closer. Um, and then for the board, one of the other things that came up is that about, I don't know if you'd call it 200 yards um, down Old Bel Belchertown Road is um, an access point for the Robert Frost Trail, which actually the connector is Old, uh, old Belchertown Road. And when you cross over to the, um, to get to the other side of Route 9, you actually they have to use Old Belchertown Road in front of the dog park as a connector on the Robert Frost Trail. So that there is, you know, people might wind up parking here to use those trailheads as well, since it goes in both directions. One trailhead will go south and one head will go north. Um, so it's just something to consider in terms of um, parking. Nate mentioned that they are, you know, thinking about putting additional parking spots um, and all the trailheads along the way. Um, but um, that's just something we want to consider. Again, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact. I don't think 50 cars are all of a sudden going to park for the Robert Frost Trail because of this here, but it's something I think we should keep in mind. Thanks, Tom. Andrew. Um, yeah, 30 seconds. I, I, I did want to just point out, I agree with 
with what Doug mentioned also in the intro in terms of the, you know, the process and, and how we're making this, this is coming to us now. I hadn't thought about the angle from the private resident. I think it's a, a really good one to point out that, you know, we need to make sure we hold ourselves to that same standard. Um, and then, you know, cynically, I was wondering what if like we didn't approve what was brought forward, what happens? I mean, like something would happen, right? And um, anyhow, um, I, I, I understand how it happened or why it happened perhaps, <clears throat> but I think we, we do need to really work hard on, on process if we think that there's a gap here to, to make sure something like this doesn't happen. Because it, it seemed like it was pretty, there's a pretty clear difference between the two plans from the parking spaces at least that someone would have caught it beforehand. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder whether we need to be a little more suspicious or diligent or whatever you want to say about town built projects. Tom. Sorry, just a quick comment on that. I think what I took away from our meeting with Nate, um, and then clarify this for me, Nate, but I feel like what we're presented with is an aggregate of small changes. And then a bunch of those smaller changes would have just, we would have never even noticed them. They're just like on the field decisions that were made. But because there were a lot of smaller on site changes that were made in the course of construction, I think that's why it's coming back. Not necessarily because there was some plan to like, I, I guess I just want to be clear that my interpretation was someone stopped and realized that all of those little things might add up to a significant change as opposed to like, oh, we got rid of these two parking spots or we had to move this fence and change the angle of it. But when you have to do all of those things together, it feels substantial. And it might not even be the same person who knew that that thing was happening, that that's also happening and so on. So I'm not defending anybody, but I, the, the, the story that I got felt more like it was like an awareness of the the growing aggregate of changes as they're happening, all of a sudden cautioned everybody to stop and bring it back to the board. And that's, that's the way I interpret it. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Chris. So um, I just wanted to mention that we're going through a process change and for Graf Park and for Kendrick Park, um, Nate was on site, you know, almost every day monitoring what was going on. And, um, you know, DPW was there too, but Nate was really writing herd over everything. And in this case, you know, the decision was made to have Nate kind of back off and let the DPW manage it on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think there was, you know, a lack of communication between DPW and our department about these changes that were going on. So I'm sure if Nate had been there on a day-to-day -day basis, like he was on the other two projects, these things would have been caught early, but that didn't happen. So I just wanted to explain that, that we're, you know, being, being um, it's being told to us that Nate needs to be part of the design process. And then when it actually comes to construction, he can't spend all of his time on the site. And so that's um, kind of things fell through the cracks as a result. So um, I'm sorry about that. Thanks, Chris. Maria. Uh, thanks, so. Doug. Yeah, that what, what Tom was saying, I, I got the same sense that it was just a collection of changes. And I, I suppose the one thing that could have happened was the test pits and locating the cap, but it's sort of 2020 hindsight, right? Because we didn't know that the cap would be so far off from where it was shown in the original plans. But that, you know, it's hard to predict that would have happened. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I, I felt like um, even if Nate had been there every day, what could have happened you know the cap had was where it was and there had to be changes made on the fly and luckily it's still got the same conceptual design there's nothing too major other than yeah i was like oh we're losing five spaces but since there wasn't a requirement for a minimum number anyways um it's kind of you know as they change old belcher town road i'm wondering at that point maybe they can assess you know whether they do need more parking at that point um and also i guess at that point they could probably make it so that the spaces are um the uh what is it eight by 19 or nine by 18 um size once they get rid of that firm but um but otherwise yeah all the comments from the rest of the board made perfect sense as far as the signage being on the road and the size being sort of 
really examine because I think when we were there, Tom, Nate, and I and Chris all were kind of like, wow, the sign size proposed out seems a little large. So it'll be good to have that go in front of the DRB and <clears throat> and possibly back to the planning board to take a look at that again. Um, but yeah, it would be great to have it all be cohesive because that you know we spent so much time getting this standard for the town. So I, I would really like that to, yeah, kind of ripple across the whole town. So I can't really remember what it looked like, but I just, I feel like that's the right move. So, um, but yeah, thanks for this. Uh, we were, when we were on site, I was just in awe of, you know, this used to be a brownfield site and now it's this really great park. So it was just uh, really great to see it, you know, finally. So after, I didn't realize it's been two years. <laughs> it looks really great. Yeah, I mean, I think that could have been some of the reason for the changes just not being so apparent is that it happened over two construction seasons. Um, you know, that there, there was an initial grading and uh, and then it was wintered and then it came picked up again. Um, and I also think this was a you know more challenging site, you know, just because we didn't know, know all those variables. So Kendrick Park actually, uh, Public Works went out there, they surveyed it, we ground truthed it with the trees and roots. And so um, when we asked for as bills, they said it's basically what was put on original plan the contractor could you know they lasered it used you know put it in their in their you know on their machines and everything was perfectly gps and so there really wasn't any change i think you know i think tom and maria said right it's kind of the aggregate and collection of changes you know i think it's also the the change in parking spaces you know number and size if it was you know the perimeter fence moved a little bit and the entry shifted a little bit to the gates i would i would i don't think that would be coming back but because you know, really it is because some of the parking, you know, the changes to parking that we wanted the board to look at it. Well, I, I, I don't want our uh, comments to make, to, to give you pause about bringing future projects back. Uh, so I thank you for, for doing that. Sure. No, I think it's, it is a good point though. I'd like to, you know, think that, you know, as more town projects, if we do think if we see changes, you know, before construction that they would come back, not, not after. All right. So um, I think we've, I mean, there's been mention of the signage going to DRB and uh, that maybe it would come back to us. Uh, Chris, what do you want from us this evening? Um, well, I would like you to approve the plan as it's presented, but put in a couple of conditions. And I did send out some conditions just late this evening that you may consider. Um, and maybe Nate or Pam can bring them up. Nate can bring them up because Pam's busy writing down what we're talking about. <laughs> I, I do have them, Nate. Nate, I do have them. Oh, there they are. Okay. So I think one thing we wanted you to do is to acknowledge that the revised plans are now becoming the approved plans for the dog park and that the dog park is going to be managed the way the management plan said it would be managed um, and that was approved the last time around. So I wanted to bring that forward. Um, the landscaping has been installed, but there's a point that it has to be maintained. And then the last item is that the proposed kiosk and sign designs shall be submitted to the planning board for review and approval after they've been reviewed by the design review board, but prior to installation. And one of us will probably bring them to the design review board along with Maureen, so we can pass along your comments with regard to um, trying to make them more similar to the, the, the signs that the town has been working on the wayfinding signs. Um, so these would be my suggested conditions if you would um, choose to adopt them. All right. Um, let's see, uh, why don't we see if there are any public comments on this project at this time? Public attendees, would you raise your hand if you would like to make a comment? Okay, I don't see any hands raised from the public. Um, so we, so so I guess uh, we'd like a motion to approve the plans as proposed and adopt them as the final plans proposed by the board. Um, and Chris, you're suggesting we include the conditions that you uh, have drafted. Um, would anyone like to make that motion? 
May we also include the findings that this is um, consistent with the relevant criteria of 11.24 and to close the public hearing? Mm -hmm. We can throw it all in the, in the, in the mix. Yep. Johanna, can you remember all that? Oh gosh, all right. I move to approve the plans as proposed with the conditions suggested by Chris, Chris Brestrup. Uh, confirm that they are in compliance with section 11.24 and close the public hearing. Great. Mm -hmm. right. Good. Tom. Second. All right. Any further discussion? from any board members? All right, we'll go through a roll call. Uh, Maria. Approve. And Tom. Aye. Jack is going to, is absent. Andrew. He's going first, Johanna, that was awesome remembering that. And I'm an I. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, Janet is uh, absent and Johanna. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Thank you, Nate, for the presentation. And again, thanks for bringing it back. Um, all right, so we have closed that public hearing. All right, the time is 729 and we will go to the next public hearing on the agenda item four so in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding Site Plan Review 2022-14 and uh, Special Permit 2022-05, Center East LLC, 446 to 462 Main Street. Request site plan approval under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw to construct 17,000 square foot, 27 unit residential mixed use building, including three affordable units with site lighting and landscaping, and to request a modification of the number of parking spaces required for the mixed use building under section seven 0.0000 and 7.9 of the zoning bylaw and seek small car parking under section 7.104 of the zoning bylaw to co-locate with the existing mixed use building known as 446 Main Street and the mixed use building known as 462 Main Street authorized by site plan reviews 2022-01 and 2020-05 dash zero five and any subsequent amendments and request a special permit to extinguish all special permits associated with parcel 14B-66. All on map 14B, parcel 66 and 68 in the BN zoning district. So this hearing is continued from May 18th and June 15th. Are there any uh, board member disclosures? Don't see any. I, Chris, is it reasonable for me to state for the record that we received statements from three board members who were absent at the last meeting, that they have listened to the recording of the previous meeting and are uh, eligible to vote this evening? Thank you. All right. Um, not having any disclosures. Uh, uh, I'll turn it over to John uh, and your team you, what, for your presentation. Okay, good evening. Yep, um, we are missing Tom Reedy tonight. He's at another meeting, uh, but hopefully we'll get through it. Uh, we've had a number of changes uh, based on your comments. Um, and I think maybe we, Best thing to do is we have a slideshow put together in Google Slides and maybe just go over that. That kind of highlights some of the uh, concerns and how we address them. Does that sound like a logical thing? Sounds good, John. I just got to figure out how to do it. I know I got to share screen or something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you should see a share yeah. screen button at the bottom of your Zoom 
window. It's green. If you drag your cursor down to the bottom, that toolbar pops up. All right, but I lost the video here. Well, when you when you click share screen, it'll bring up the screens that are available and the applications you have open, and you can select the Google. I can do it, John, if you'd like. All right, yeah, if you can get that up, Christine, please. Mm -hmm. And maybe introduce yourself. I'm not sure all the members know who you are. Sure. My name is Christine Royal. I'm an architect, um, and I, I'm working with uh, Maple Street Architects and John on this project. Good to see some of you again that I know, and nice to meet others of you that I don't. Thank you, Christine. I'm going to go into presentation mode, John, and um, then you can talk away. All right. Can everybody see what I have on my screen? Or should I just talk about what you have on yours? Uh, you talk yeah, you should talk about what uh, Christine is showing us because we can see what she's got on the screen, but we can't see whatever you're looking at. All right, I got a box that says you will have to leave this meeting to join the new meeting. Uh oh. So, join meeting, let's see. I'm tempted to suggest that you ignore it. <laughs> Indeed. John, are you able to see what I, sh what I shared to the meeting now? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, now I just have the cover slide up. I mean, I have the Zoom uh, thing on my screen on the bottom here, but it's not letting me get into the video. John could leave the meeting and come back in. I, I uh, think it John, you, you can't share your screen at the same time as Christine is. So right. I, believe, I believe Christine is sharing the video or the slide presentation that you're referring to. Is that correct? Yeah. So we should be good to go. Oh, okay. Okay. And, no, and John, I got you here. If you want Christine to move the presentation forward to the next slide, just say you're ready to do that. Okay, I think we're ready. So this here, I know Doug, you were concerned about the, um, I gotta get a leave Lebanon winner. About the view coming down Main Street. So we took a bunch of photos and kind of uh, imposed the future Amherst Media Building. And again, to remind you, I did have conversation with the director there and they do intend to start in the spring of uh, 2023. So that building is kind of where it shows on this, uh, presentation here. And this is about from in front of Bruno's at the bottom of uh, Triangle Street. So as you can see, the Amherst Media Building and then the other Arrow proposed Center East Commons, you can just kind of see the roof line in behind it from this eastbound travel lane. And also, you know, the various roof lines in that area, they all kind of blend in. Okay, next one, Chris. <clears throat> this is uh, about the same view, it's actually from the opposite corner of Triangle and Main, looking kind of straight down at the Amherst Media Building, which kind of shows you the view that we anticipate is gonna look like. And you can see right now, right there is the current uh, building that we did last year. So you can kind of, if you can imagine that roof line moving forward for the new building, it's gonna be almost in that same direction just heading west so that's about probably what you'll see but again that's looking in between the Amherst Media Building and the, the big white house to the north and also to remind you on that corner of Dickinson and Maine just to the before Bruno's that before that yellow building on the right there is that big gray three-story and next to Bruno's it's only separated by about 16 feet Okay, Chris. 
So these are some of the changes from the original submittal. You know, we now have a nice courtyard in between the buildings. And again, that area that Chris is kind of going on now, that's like 34 between 34 feet between the existing building and uh, the west wall of the new building. And that total area there is about uh, 900 square feet up to the front porch on the existing building. So we're able to add that patio in there and we're using some of the stones that are currently around the lamp posts in the parking lot that are gonna to need to be removed. So that has to be built into that little slope where that person is standing on the patio. And so we're gonna use those, it'll be kind of like a whole sitting, L-shaped sitting area. And we also have the granite stones um, from the previous foundation. Chris, I'm not, this here shows the old presentation, doesn't it? Does it not with the new building with a full front? No, this is this is the updated presentation. Yeah, this is just the two-story reduced map. It just kind of looks, yeah. yeah. And you know, as part of that, we did the, the single peak over the office door. We made that whole first floor office area versus a studio and an office. And we kind of separated the windows, spread them out, so it kind of mimics the uh, historic building on the left. And we provided some screening, as you'll see on one plan, relocated a lot of the heating and air conditioning units, pulled them together, put some shrubs and uh, some of the white vinyl fence that is actually on site that we need to move. So we repurposed that for uh, screening of the AC units. There was one tree on Gray Street that was hopefully going to be saved, but we were going to work on that. I did meet with Alan Snow out there earlier in the, the spring about that tree, but now since we redid the parking lot and have the uh, exit out to Gray Street, it actually falls in the perfect spot in between the mature maple trees there. So I uh, was able to save that tree. And this shows the view from... Uh, Chris, can you go back to the previous slide, please? And then again, to highlight the changes that we did to the building itself, um, we did lose four apartments, so we're 15% fewer there. Uh, we lost a total of three bedrooms. Uh, just by reconfiguring one of the stairways, we were able to add a bedroom and have a two bedroom. Um, so right now we have one two bedroom, then a mix of studios and the one bedrooms. And the total building, Given that we eliminated the third floor on our front, you know, we're down um, by 9% there, then the front elevation was reduced by 60%, you know, looking at it coming up Main Street. Okay. And this is the rendering again, looking from across Main Street, kind of looking directly straight on where the new building will be. And it kind of shows the the rendering by computer, which, you know, a lot of times you don't get that proper depth of field type thing. So I took the picture from across the street that actually shows the view. And the wall for the new building will be just about even with the end of that hedge right there, right about there, and then behind the transformer. So it's pretty much where the building that we uh, tore down was. And that space with the patio is kind of in behind those beech trees. John, John, the new building is also on the same plane parallel to Main Street that the old demolished building was, just to clarify that. Okay, thank you. Okay, next. Okay, here um, we were thinking about how, you know, to add things to the site. Uh, one thing, that I actually did at my house several years ago. If you notice the top of the slide there, um, we always had the side hill and it goes down about 50 feet and then it's 150 feet long. That was a PIA to mow and take care of and burn off every couple of years and all that. And the farmers, they were having trouble with uh, pollinating and bee colonies disappearing. <clears throat> so I said, why don't we just plant wildflowers there. So we got a bulldozer, uh, we graded the whole thing down, added some loam, and I had a 
hydro seeder come in and took them about 30 minutes to spray 7,000 square feet of wildflowers. But now this is what you see. They're really coming, you know, and getting thicker. So we got a whole mix of bees and um, different birds, um, all kinds of things going through there now, which I think, you know, serves a purpose. And we're kind of doing that just for a little area along the corner there that just to dress up the corner a little more when people are there waiting on the bus or walking down Gray Street. Okay, next. Okay, these are the actual mini split units that we will be using. The, the one on the left, as you're looking, is a 6,000 BTU unit and the one on the right is a 9,000 BTU unit. Again, because these units are so small, the, the dwelling units themselves, they don't need a lot of heating and air conditioning because they're pretty much airtight also. Um, so each one is controlled by a separate thermostat. It's a one-on-one -on -one situation. So the bedroom has the 6,000 on a one bedroom and the 9,000 is in a living room. And they're 22 inches high or just under 22 inches, 21.6 and 11 and a quarter deep and 31 and a half you know wide so like i said before they're kind of like a, a big suitcase and we're able to stack them they don't have to be above one another so we're kind of offsetting so we'll have one in the front one just above that just behind it and then a third one just above that and behind that so a one foot stand like that and three units above it is just about the height of a uh, six foot vinyl fence. So it'll be you know, pretty well screened. And I think adding the shrubbery and uh, sections of vinyl fence kind of gives a nice uh, look to that whole interior area where the people can sit and relax. Like, like it says there, they're comparable as far as the DBA, the noise uh, to your re refrigerator. I mean, I'm sitting here and I can Refrigerators over there, I can hardly hear it running. So they are quiet. Next. Okay, on the parking front, um, again, I did a lot of thinking on that and a lot of research and all that. Um, I said before, pretty much what you read here. And then looking at it realistically, asking for the number of compact spaces here. Um, is only 5% more over the 50% that you know, you're allowed in a bylaw. I mean, anything is waivable. So that comes out to about two and a half compact spaces. And as I said before, of the 239 vehicles I surveyed there, 72% of them were 15 feet, six inches or under, you know, fit perfectly into any compact space. And this area has the direct access for transit um, town's got great sidewalks, you know, great area for biking. And I was going to approach Valley Bike. I don't know if any area down here would be a good spot, you know, to have them add another rack of um, bikes, you know, for that Valley Bike rental thing. Something that I was going to kind of pursue. And we are going to do parking stickers. I talked with Vertex Property Management. Um, they've done that in the past. And as I said before, I've got the parking stickers for Spruce Ridge next door. Just never had the, the reason to use them because we've always had less cars than, uh, than spaces. And there is a plan um, if, if there is a problem in the future. And this is also on a building that we did last year, if you remember the people I were on the board then. 18 months, I think it says in the conditions that uh, you can come back and look at the parking situation again. And if we need more parking, then we had like ghost parking on that plan, uh, which we did indicate the two spaces on the north of the parking area as part of that. Um, well, we also came up, I guess I came up with a plan that if it really comes down to having a problem, we do have an area right in the front where the beech trees are. And I, I have it on mine. Chris, I don't think you have the shadow park or Mike, you must have that, right? I do, but I, I don't have it here with me at home. Um, I have to try to access my computer at work and email it to myself. Well, if you I want me to do that. <laughs> if I can um, figure out how to share a screen, oh no. But 
basically, I think the deal was that um, John came up with a layout where um, parking would be um, the parking lot, as John is calling it, shadow parking would be parallel to Main Street between 446 and, you know, the Main Street sidewalk. So um, that would be what a net of six or seven spaces because we'd, we'd lose two of the spaces on the west side of that entry driveway where the handicap space is shown right below CEC2. We could only maintain two of those spaces and then we'd have to have an entry drive um, that went from east to west and served um, parking spaces that would be head in pointing at 446 and, and the south end of CEC2. Um, we'd get a net of six spaces or something in that in that Seven, location, yeah. but you know we'd be losing the beech tree. Um, you know, I mean, we can we can engineer it to work. We might need a little wall to hold it up um, because there'd be a change in grade from the sidewalk. Um, so we thought about that, but you know, obviously, we stated at the very first hearing that we really like to maintain the green space um, that's you know at Main Street and Gray Street to the west of um, 446. Yeah, that would be a net of seven additional spaces. Seven, okay, and, seven. Yeah, and it would kick in uh, a fourth handicap spot. Uh, the plan that you see on the screen now has the three handicap because it's below 50 spaces. Um, if we end up adding the seven, that would give us a total of 54. And we would just add the handicap space that is up in front of the new building we did last year back as a handicap because we took it off now because we, we added a handicap down in front of the new building in the sidewalk where the office area is down there. So just a possibility, you know, it would be behind the front setback of 10 feet, well behind that, um, plenty of area between there and the travel lanes of Main Street and while we're on that, the fourth parking space that we added down in the front of the uh, area there, from that south edge of the parking spot, right down on the entrance driveway, Chris. Yeah, that spot there, from that spot right there to the travel lane white line starting is 29 feet. So there's plenty of room there for cars to approach Main Street, see what's coming up or down and, and exit safely. And again, there's 25 um, parking spaces available along the west side of Gray Street. And, you know, I'm a firm believer in less pavement, the better, not because of expense, but, you know, once it's there, it's there. And I think everything meets the uh, guidelines, it's the design standards that Mike looked at and everything. Next. Hey, this is that the parking data sheet that I had done. Um, you know, it is what it is, I guess. Um, I did it three times, you know, once in 20 from, for the other building and then twice this year. And the last one being May 3rd, where I thought all the students would be here, you know, getting ready for finals and all that. So I figured out what was a good time, the last day of UMass classes to, to go through and Anybody that was here to take exams certainly would have their car if they have a car. So these numbers I think are pretty representative and um, the property at 22 High Street that I own, that's been proven for many years now that for 40 bedrooms, I've got 34 spaces there and it's always fluctuated between 23 and 27, 28 cars at the most. Um, Christine actually lived there for eight years and maybe could attest to, has there been any parking problems dealing you know, with that ratio? I never had. No. So I think these numbers are pretty realistic. Um, they are a good representation of what's out there today um, based on the car sizes and, and the number of cars that tenants actually have. And, you know, with the increase in gas prices and so forth, that, that stays where it is, I'm sure there'll be even fewer. So that's you know, kind of what I based the numbers on. And the two new things that I added there, um, Presidential 2 and uh, Crestview up in North Amherst, they both have a bus stop right at their driveway. Uh, so I thought those would be more comparable 
than doing, you know, a, a three family or a four family in the area of Main Street that is probably rented to, to undergrads, you know, like Salem Place. I mentioned that before. People ran into the situation there. They bought them as condos, then they went to resell them, couldn't sell them. So they were getting high rents for undergrads. And that's not my my thing to do. So I think these are pretty realistic and, and honest numbers. And I think the parking that we presented uh, would be more than adequate. Next. So Chris brought up, you know, in one of the findings, I think, you know, why are we changing the lights? Well, it was a learning experience for me. The, the photo on the right was taken at uh, 9.52 p.m. from the on-site you know, surveillance cameras, security cameras, and it shows the light on the north end of the parking lot, which would be off to the right between, if just follow that aisle right up, um, you know, right up to the north. <coughs> and that light you can see shows halfway up the fence and halfway up the wall of the building. And you know, I said, that's way too much light. You know, these people got to sleep at night. So that's why I kind of went to a different style that I have at Spruce Ridge next door. And Christine, again, can probably say, is there enough light there at nighttime? You know, just having uh, those fountain post lights like you see on the left side of the screen. Those are okay, Chris, Christine? Yeah. Yep. And it's not a high use or a high volume turnover where people are going through the parking lot all night long type thing. So these lights to the right there, I have them set up now. So they dim to 20% at 11 p.m. And you really can't tell that much because they're LED. The guy had to be flown in from Indiana or Illinois to program these things. And he says, I said, well, drop them down to 50%. He says, 50%, you won't see any difference. So they do dim down just to a little more bronze colored light at 11 p.m. But then the emergency lights that you see in front of the sidewalk there, those stay on dusk to dawn and they're bright as you can see. So only the bollard lights along the sidewalk and the big pole lights dim down to 20%. But you can see you know, the ones on the left there, that are lit up at night, that's actually at my house. You know, I like the way they looked and they provide plenty of light. So that gives you an idea of the, the pattern of the light, of the actual lights. And I think I have a 75 watt LED bulb in those fixtures. And the one in the lower left are two of the lights actually at 22 High Street, just how they're spread out. Next. So what we did for the buildings, um, we do have that 20 foot separation between uh, the main north wall of the existing and the new wall. Um, the only area is that eight by 22 foot area uh, that serves as the handicap entrance and bathroom. The front where the patio is there, again, is 34 by about 30 feet, I think, up to the porches. It's all open and then there's only that area of an open porch of five feet and the 18 foot wall. So really the 18 foot wall by 3.6 feet is like 72 square feet of space versus the 20. And that's assuming you folks feel that the 20 foot separation is probably where they should be only because that townhouse buildings could be three stories and the townhouse bylaw says they need to be at least 20 feet apart. And if these both lots were in a BN zone and I kept them separate, uh, the old house was 4.9 feet off the property line. And I think if I read the, the zoning right, I could either have a zero setback built on the property line or have 10 foot from there. So 14.9 14 feet. So I think, you know, for that little area in the way that the patio and area opens up there with the grass and the shrubs around the uh, ACU and it just makes for a nice setting for everybody there and uh -huh. we added the back doors to all of the uh, stairways except one so there's only one unit that doesn't have direct access out of a back door down the stairs to that open area. John do you have a site plan you could show us when you to explain these things you're saying? Yep, there's one coming up. Great. Um, 
So here, you know, we feel that it fits the neighborhood really well. And it's actually, I feel that's probably one of the only sites you're going to find with mature landscaping on both frontages on a corner lot. So it allows for any new building there to be pretty well screened uh, from pretty much all directions. Um, I think we've met you know, all the requirements of 11.24. I guess there was a question on the 3.2040, but looking at those, I think we kind of meet all of those also. Town engineer uh, has approved them with some comments, uh, meets the building code, the fire separation, the fire department, and uh, meets the setbacks and height requirements. And the, uh, the master plan calls for infill, you know, in these areas, I think it's pretty clear with that. And when you do an infill, you have to blend existing buildings with other buildings that are maybe already on site or proposed rather. So I think we've done that pretty well here, blending the existing and the two new buildings. And uh, I think if we had, filed for a demo plan on 446 Main Street, that would have been very poorly received by this historical commission, but probably everybody in the neighborhood. So we're, we're trying to you know, make everybody happy and not change the environment on that street corner. Okay. Next. On oh, that other slide just shows the height of the um, the building that was moved from Amherst College there, you follow that straight across the power lines, almost even with the top of those maple trees that will buffer this new proposed building. Thank you. So the master plan, I, I looked that over and, and, you know, part of that, the priority implementation of it, um, it mentions a couple, several things in section 2E. And if you read that, the following actions represent the initial priorities for implementation of this master plan for members of town boards and committees, elected and appointed town officials, town staff, town meeting, and all interested citizens. And one of those underneath that 2E is subparagraph uh, four, and it's that areas to be developed, the areas available and suitable for infill to redevelopment and or more intensive new development for housing commercial activity, public facilities and infrastructure. So I think, you know, it really nails it on the head there. And uh, Janet had done that survey about the number of businesses in the area. So, you know, we're fitting into the BN priority that was passed in 2013, you know, higher density housing and service areas. So there's a lot of services in the area and so forth. So I think, you know, we've done a decent job with uh, meeting those goals. No, that's the video. Yeah, I seem to have lost it for some reason. Yeah, Rachel did a, a video simulation of a car driving from Triangle Street east on Main Street. And, you know, it gives you a good perspective as people driving down the street. I think it's just taking a moment to load. It's like slowly filling in. Oh, look, it just said it couldn't load the YouTube player. Well, I have that on mine, but I don't want to mess things up here. <laughs> um, why, don't, why don't we skip this for a minute and go through the rest of the deck, and then okay. we can pull up the YouTube separately. Yeah. Um, one request uh, from you folks was to see some of the trees with no leaves on them. So this is just a slide to kind of represent what that might look like. Uh, bear in mind that the beech trees, the three in the front, those two and the one on the corner, they kind of maintain about half their leaves during the winter time. I've got some pictures of them doing the borings in February and it shows them pretty much the bottom half was pretty thick with, uh, with brown leaves. And you can kind of see where the pollinator garden is there on a, on a corner. Okay. So this is a, a, like a big overview, an aerial shot showing where, where the site would be in the next one. So this is, I think, a good representation of what the, the site will look like and really kind of stands out the amount of green space that we have. 
Uh, we are under the 65% by about 4,300 square feet, I think, that we could you know, add more paving or whatever, and I don't see any need for it. Um, I think this really blends well. It has a good traffic pattern, a good pedestrian walkway system, and allows for you know, a very adequate site maneuvering for everybody there. And the bus stop being right there on this property, <laughs> uh, the shelter itself is on this property and, and we're gonna work on our easement there. I think Tom has got it pretty well drafted up and we'll work with Jason and get the details on that and file that, you know, along with the easements for the sewer and water on the other building. So, you know, it just shows, can you folks read that enough? You know, about the existing parking, the new parking and building numbers. The, the text is legible, John. Yeah. John, if you, if, or Christine, if you go back to the previous overview slide, I mean, if you kind of look at this, the density of this develop, proposed development versus what you see at, you know, John's High Street development, what you see across the street at the Bruno's commercial area, I, that's what I refer to it as, um, the, the cluster of houses at South Whitney and Main Street to, to the right, bottom right, um, the commercial development that, I don't know, is that still a frame store on High Street and Main Street? Yeah, that whole complex there. Yeah, that and the residential behind it. I mean, you know, um, and even the three residential houses on the west side of Gray Street. You know, if you squint and look at this, it's, it's a very similar density overall. If you, you know, if you were to take, what is, what is the total part? It's like 2.2, 2. 2 point something acres, John, uh, of this piece, this land. Uh, it's and, one point. Or 1. 1.9 or something like that. No, it's 52,131 square feet. So, I mean, even though these are residential, uh, in nature to the north and a lot of residential along Main Street, it's it's of a similar density and pattern um, of some some of the clusters of development that are that have occurred along Main Street and the side streets going off of Main Street. So just kind of wanted you to be aware of that. It's not it's not it's not foreign. It's not something foreign that's being proposed by John. All right, thank you, John. Is that your presentation or are there more slides? No, there are a couple more. So yeah, this is kind of a, a summary, you know, I feel that we now have a great plan after implementing, you know, the comments and uh, blending the existing historic mixed use with a much needed new housing, you know, that will have the three affordable units in there and um, more open space, I think, Everybody on site there will have, you know, plenty of area to choose to have a quiet time or whatever. And um, the patio in the front of the buildings are actually, they're come, I wanted to maintain that too. And so they're 50 plus feet off of Main Street where the 10 foot setback is only required off of Main Street for any building. And we do have that nice option that's beautiful mature trees already. It's not like Amherst Media where they're planting two inch caliper trees that are gonna take 25 to 30 years to look like what you see on that picture. And we dealt with the HVAC units as, as best we could. We thought about an area of flat roof. Uh, it just doesn't work architecturally and uh, insurance wise, they frown on third floor flat roofs. We added the little wildflower area. We meet all our requirements, I think. And looking actually at the new mixed use bylaw, we're only 962 square feet of office space short of the 30% of the total floor area on all three buildings. So even though we're under the old bylaw, we're not too far off the 30%. And most of the parking is in the rear as the new bylaw kind of wants to. So all in all, it's a very safe and efficient site for the tenants, uh, for vehicles, for trash recycling, all that. And, you know, I just, I think it's a nice building with higher density and it's a mixed use building where it makes the most sense, I think, in, in any area of town at this point. So all right. 
Yeah, so the next one just kind of has all the other submittals and some renderings if you wanted to take a quick look through them. Okay, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping you'll show us the site plan because I don't understand what you did with the mechanical units yet and uh, some of the clearances that you went described earlier. Mike, do you have that site plan? Well, if we look at what's on the screen right now, um, I can't use the pointer, I guess, but if you we look at up, Chris, we could, I can point to this one and where the HVAC units are, or, um, I um there, there, there are one, two, three, four, there are five locations where the AC units are proposed. If we look at the new building to the West end closest to gray street, there's a cluster. You see the gray rectangles. <laughs> Um, that's those are pads with, uh, where the AC units will be proposed. Um, off uh, four feet off of the pad is the, you can kind of see a white uh, line. It's that's the fence that's being proposed. Um, there's some shrubs to the north and south of that area. It's not totally enclosed with fence, so it's a little bit easier to get in there for access. We, they're just shrubs um, at either end. Um, if you follow down in a, in a counterclockwise uh, direction in the, in the crook of the building, the L shape, there's another pad right there with a short piece of white fence to the west. So you wouldn't see that from the street um, or in, and it also further um, blocks some, the view from some of the uh, residential unit windows um, on the south side of that building. And again, there's a, a cluster of shrubs in front or on the south side of that pad. If you go down, straight down, there's another cluster there, uh, two pads with AC units. And again, the white fence, there's um, shrubs on the south side there, um, that more like a hedge that would continue across to the other side of that walk and enclose the, um, the patio area, which is right there. And if you continue around to the east side of the building, uh, nope, come back down. Yep, right yep. there, there's another uh, pad with AC units. Again, the white, uh, white fence on the east side, you can see a section there with shrubs, again, enclosing um, the south end of that um, mechanical pad. And then finally, if you continue all the way around to where the bike rack is um, located, right there is the uh, fifth pad with AC units. And I don't know if you can see the fence, but. I can switch to a different, to a PDF if we want to zoom in. I, I believe there is a, yeah, there is a fence there. It just blends in with yeah. the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, but that, obviously that um, uh, <clears throat> cluster of mechanical units isn't visible, you know, from the public way. Uh, but there's a fence on the north side of that uh, pad. All right, um, Thank you. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's right next to the bicycle storage with no windows there. And it's in a three foot setback in a building walls there. So it kind of fits in a little nook there. So all of these areas are well away from, you know, any tenant windows, stuff like that. The ones on the west side, you know, since we moved the building east, um, up in the northwest corner of the new building, that's like 15.7 feet, I think, or something off the, the property line. So it's away from the trees better, save the roots and all that. So I think all in all, it's, you know, it makes a good layout for all of the, the mechanicals. Do we have the site plan to actually show where those are? We can, I guess they must be at the back, the, the black and white plan set. Yeah. If you wanna look at yeah. some of the distances and dimensions, they're, they're labeled. Or the setbacks. I can also. Um, yeah. No, they're I not on the slideshow. They're a separate thing. Yeah, I, I can stop sharing this and pull up another drawing in the meantime. So all in all, you know, that's that's the way we're looking at it. Um, again, just trying to blend old and new, and I think with any infill, you kind of have to have a little give and take. And I think it just worked out pretty well with uh, the way everything is laid out now and, and just makes for a nice development. And I would look for your approval. 
So any okay. questions? So board, board members, uh, we're a little bit after eight o'clock. We usually take a, a break right around eight o'clock. Would, would you like to do that now or would you like to continue the deliberation? Yeah, board and then members? we can get up that uh, file maybe so you can have a better look at that. Okay, well then why don't we do that? We'll take a five minute break. Uh, everybody can turn, on, turn off your camera and mute your microphone and we'll be back at, I have uh, 8.13 now, so we'll try 8.18 or at the worst 8.20. Thank you. Okay, we're off for like five minutes. Five minutes.
All right, the time is 8.18 and uh, any folks who are back uh, can turn their cameras back on so that we can get a sense of whether we're waiting for anyone to return. Uh, Christine, were you able to bring up the video? I do have it. All right, so once we've got everyone back, uh, looks like we've still got Johanna uh, to return. Okay, so um, why don't you cue it up? And John, you are muted as in case you intended to say something to us. Okay. It's seriously thinking about going. <laughs> Still. Still. I just ran it while we were on break without an issue. So it's Murphy's Law. Yeah. Hmm. I was thinking maybe I could trick it. Oh, there we go. You did it. <laughs> I tricked it. So you don't see it till you get to the intersection, really. Then all the peaks, I think, you know, match pretty well through there and um, just makes for a nice, either whether you're coming into town or leaving town, um, it's like looking at any of the houses along Main Street or any other street. Um, you see them for a little while. Pedestrians, I think, will have a good view. So. And looking up Gray Street, you know, all the mature trees and everything all the way up Gray Street kind of blends in with the backdrop of, of all the houses and roof lines along there. So. Okay. Great. So thank you, John, and, and thank you, Christine. And we have, um, I think, the site plan up too to show the locations of the AC better. <clears throat> it's a little bit clearer in black and white, the ones that we were looking at. Yeah. And the shrubs can, and the Can you expand line. that and make it bigger? I can make it bigger. I just have to move all of you first. The ones on the yeah. west that we talked about, the yeah. ones in the crook, the ones on the side. And this dot is the fence, and these are the shrubs, the patio as described, the fence, the shrubs, another mechanical pad there, and then the last one. Yeah, and these units don't lead a lot, need a lot of clearance. Um, from the back of the unit to a building wall, they only need three inches for air circulation. And I think they need 18 inches from where it's blowing out the front of the unit to any obstruction. So that's why the fences are placed, you know, about two feet apart. And it makes for service work also. And as you can see on this slide, it's 15.2 feet off the property liner. And I think when we started, it was 10.7 feet. And that's why I met with Alan Snow about the best way to deal with the trees there and save the roots and all that. So um, now they're pretty well protected. Just makes for a nice layout. And those back doors, you can see, that's why I put those units in the corner. The two exit doors for the stairwells there, it, they're kind of tucked in there against the mechanical room. Yeah, right in the corner, interior corner of the building. Yes, yes. No, no. Uh, in the crook. Right there. Right. Yeah, so we got the two exit doors. And again, those serve all of the apartments in those two blocks will have access to the patio area and the green space there. And I actually moved, we had 
four hemlocks along the corners of the existing and new building. And I said, well, let's put them out against the property line there to better screen that, uh, that space there. So, so have, tenants will have a better private area there and look better from the street. Okay, is that everything? Yeah, I think so. All right, thank you very much. So board members, and who'd like to go first? Uh, I know several of you missed the last meeting. Um, I'll have some comments that I'll make at some point. Andrew. Thanks, Doug, and uh, thanks everyone for the presentation. Um, I've got no issues with the massing. I thought, you know, like the way you did the rendering actually was useful to see, I think, for, for some folks who might not appreciate um, what the uh, Amherst Media is doing to that. I think it, it's, it's clear to me that this is not going to be an overwhelming, out of scale um, building. So totally comfortable with that. I did want to comment, though, on something I heard from the Zoom last week on the rear parking there's comment about one-way entrance and two-way entrance. And I think someone said that the exit on Gray Street is wider than it needs to be for a one-way. And the reason why I ask that is the only thing that, that gives me really sort of heartache, it's not even the number of spaces. I think actually this is a good project to lean in with a small number of spaces, but to have 20 of them be subcompact to me seems a little ridiculous. And I'm wondering if there is if there's like two extra feet of exit, and I thought there may have been a comment to that effect, like we needed 14 and there's 16, could you could you just make that a true one-way exit and pull your spaces back into the parking field a little bit more and convert at least some of those from subcompact to compact, even if it means losing a space or two? I, I, I think like the subcompact to me is gonna be a parking issue. I'll, I'll let John, consider that but one of the reasons we kept it at 16 was just and it's true you can make it a little narrower for one way with angled spaces because it's easier to maneuver and back out but john might know a little bit more about um access for fire trucks potentially that's that's a way for a fire truck to pull in from the gray street side but my personal feeling is that they would probably not pull in um, and, and stage themselves so close to a burning building, they'd probably stage on Gray Street. But as John might want to comment on that. Um, well, I think, yeah, that's, that's part of it. But the other part is in between the actual parking spaces at 16 feet. Um, so I don't think we want to kind of channel that down anymore. Um, and again, we're only talking about two and a half spaces over the 50% that could be allowed in the bylaw. And again, you do have the option of waiving any part of the bylaw. If it comes down to brass tacks, um, we can make those three Southwest spaces two feet deeper. They're far enough away from the building. And we can, right. move, the, um, can move them uh, one foot West and then on the East end of the parking lot, create two more feet there. So we have, then we get down to the 50%, a little under the 50%. But to me, with the amount of vehicles out on the road there and the actual sizes of the vehicles that are in use today, small SUVs, compact cars, you know, the midsize cars are 15 foot, six inches or less. So I think it really serves the population of cars that are out there and, and having that couple extra compact spaces, if, it, if it's a big issue, Yes, we can deal with it and get it back down to the 50%, but I don't think it's it's really worth it. I think having a couple more parking spaces is compact. And I'm not, I'm not even thinking about the ratio. It's just more like the actual application. If you go around the corner, you don't find a spot, you turn around the corner, and then all you have is subcompacts. I think it's actually more about the width. To me, it's more about the width than the depth where you pull in and you know you may not be able to open your door because somebody had, you know, didn't do a good job parking. That's, that's often my experience with those sub compact, with the compact spots, as well as with the angle, which people aren't necessarily used to, to using. I, I think yeah. if you get a couple more in there, I think it would, I think it would be worth it. You know, if somebody comes in and parks an F-150 in that first spot, you're kind of, you're kind of screwed. And I know some people will 
who aren't subcompact will just go into those. Yeah. Well, I've parked my F-150. Um, it's a crew cab, not a crew yeah. cab, but an extended cab. Um, I've parked that in the compact spaces over there. And the other realistic <laughs> point You're is, the, <laughs> the realistic point is, you know, when you have a truck like that or any bigger vehicle, I mean, one of the tenants at the building we did last year has a grand marquee, you know, an old boat from Florida. And she pulls in and her tires are almost up to the curb in a compact space and it fits fine. Um, they're still eight feet wide. And I think that car is 78 inches versus like an average of 72. But that's the other realistic thing is cars generally will pull up, uh, not maybe hitting the curb, but so they're actually using less of the space than, than the 16 feet. But if you think that's a big issue, then we can make those three spaces, I think, full spaces. Do you see anything with that, Mike? Well, it, yeah, we might, we'd be, um, could you pull up the plan maybe just so we can, we, I, I think I know exactly what you're Yeah, we'd be pushing it closer to that tree that we tried so hard to no, see. It's only another foot. I think we have room there. Uh, and then, then add two feet to the east side. We need to, we need, if we did two spaces, we'd have to push that curb two feet to the west, closer to that maple tree. But, you know, I think we have the, we have the depth to add the two, you know, two feet to make those 18 feet deep. Right. And still have the 16 foot aisle. Right. I'm, right. I'm saying add a foot to the west side and then move the rest of the spaces east. Oh, I see what you're feet. saying. Yeah, we could, we could, we, um, because they're at an angle anyway. So if you're pulling in, you know, from yeah. in front of the yeah. other building, mm -hmm. you're at an angle. Right. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had an article circulate amongst the planning board that, that just talked about, um, if the, whether it's always appropriate to build um, kind of one-to-one -one or two-to-one or to these fixed ratios. And it was, it was a pretty thought-provoking article. I'd seen it a couple of weeks ago too, I think. But um, I think that sort of helps corroborate my view that I think, it, I think it's okay to lean in with fewer spaces here um, in total. But again, they got to be usable. Um, and um, I think if we can get squeeze a little bit more depth in some of these or squeeze a little bit more width or even if you pull out a spot like to make them wider you know i think i'd be amenable to doing something like that you know going from whatever 47 to 46 or something like that um i i, I feel like it'll be difficult for people to to use that on a regular basis as is okay um we can certainly look at that i, th I mean i think it's doable to to add two two to three um standard spaces just to convert what's there to standard not to right. have no no that yeah exactly that's what i meant sorry john yeah, yeah. okay thanks Please. andrew um maria thanks doug and uh thanks to the team for the presentation um uh i just want to say i yeah, this is my last meeting. I'm so glad we're ending on this project because I, I feel like uh, this is a whole different planning board when you brought your earlier project to the east. And um, I'm so glad that these two, you know, through iterations with the planning board and the planning department and building department, that I think it's really improved a lot. I mean, I like the latest change where you put the office all on the first and that, rare, that front piece. So it really feels like it's addressing the street, the public. And I like the change you did with, um, <clears throat> well, this was from before the last meeting, but just bringing down the scale of that front piece to match the, I mean, it really showed in the video how clearly it matches the context and the scale. Um, I still have issue with how close it is on the north side of the existing, but you know, you're doing the best you can with the space you have for this parcel. And I feel like this is like the perfect project for the zone it's in and for what you can do with the site. Um, I, I think that you've done a lot of improvement through these sort of, you know, interactions with different boards. And, and so I really appreciate you listening and, you know, responding. And um, I think that point you brought up, I, I think it was you, John, who said that um, from your earlier project, you had this sort of condition of like the 18 month check-in on like how the parking's doing. So, you know, if there are mm -hmm. still all these sort of um, worries about, what you're proposing is going to work maybe we could add that 
And it's also just good information for this board to have moving forward as far as, you know, like whether this ratio is working and whether the size of the parking spaces is working. So maybe, you know, I, I don't know what I'm proposing, whether it's change the design or just leave the design as is and have that condition, but just to sort of, um, you know, I like that as a solution because it's kind of like, you know, it's at the um, property owner's risk, right? They're the ones proposing this. If it's a problem moving forward, whether it's from, you know, the abutters complaints or the people who are using this um, property, you know, can't make it work. Then they realize, all right, we need to make something or we need to make an adjustment of some kind. So I, I like that um, that 18 month thing. And um, and uh, what was the other thing? I like the idea about maybe getting some valley bike racks there. Um, the more you can promote, you know, other means of transportation, I think is a good overall thing to do anyways. So um, I like that idea, but, um, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, just, it's clear you, you've done a lot of work as far as you're probably uh, didn't realize, John, that you would be such an expert on parking counts and patterns. But um, no, I, I think that it shows that you really do care about, you know, finding the best fit for this parcel for the town. And um, I think that, you know, putting housing first instead of parking makes a lot of sense, especially for this location. Um, Maria, we just lost your video mid sentence oh, there. Or, or your sound. We you lost your sound mid, mid Oh, sound. sorry. I don't That's know right. when I cut off during my monologue. <laughs> just, anyway, just the last, just the last. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, I know. I think that, you know, it, it's clear from the sort of the video you showed and from the elevations that uh, it really the, it fits the scale of the site. Um, there are some areas and corners that are tight and, you know, kind of not as good as maybe some other portions of the project, but overall, you know, I, I think it really is solving a lot of challenges that this parcel presented. Um, and I think it's come a long way from when it was started back in um, May. Um, but um, I guess, yeah, if maybe we can do that sort of the, the condition about, you know, a check-in with the parking, I think it's probably a good thing just because there were concerns. And also, yeah, it'd be good education-wise as far as um, having the board sort of aware of how parking is doing in the downtown and um, village centers. So, but yeah, thanks again for all the effort. It's uh, really neat to see this project evolve. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Maria. Um, I don't see other hands. I'll, I'll make my comments. Um, I think it was slide five in your slide deck that had the image from, from Main Street <clears throat> looking slightly Northeast. Um, and that's, that's kind of the image that for me is a real sticking point. Um, and that's where it looks like the north wing of the building is really looming over the house. Um, so I, I still have a problem with that. And I feel like the house is just getting overwhelmed. Um, I appreciate all the views you've done. Um, and I appreciate your, you know, hearing me last time and doing the views from Main Street, um, but I'm still uncomfortable with that. Uh, I wish that wing was farther back, uh, that the house had more uh, breathing room. Uh, I'd actually sort of flip that wing of that building and the, and the parking and put the parking between the house and the building, um, and then have the, you know, the north-south wing go farther back. But um, would you? If, 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 if I'm, you know, if I'm the outlier, so be it. Um, I will say I would be much more comfortable getting a few more, a little more input. Um, so uh, I, would, I would really like to see the design review board look at this and, and even the local historic district uh, commission look at this. Um, so when we come to the point of making motions, I am likely to request that we refer it to them for their opinions. Um, and well, then, I, have a, I have a question. Would you be comfortable with uh, that building if it was 20 feet away, wall to wall, like a townhouse um, zoning bylaw allows? 20 feet away from the street? No, 20 feet away from the existing building to the new wall. And this is the north-south dimension? Yeah, the north wall, the eight by 22 foot area, 
right now is 12.2 feet, I think, off of the new building wall. So is yep. that your, your major concern there? Yeah, my major concern is the, the east-west wing and how, how it looms over the, the house. Well, that, that eight by 22 foot area is not part of a historical review because it was added in 1980. So it doesn't meet the 50 year requirement. And I can apply for a demo of that, take the walls and a roof down, make that a slab for an entry, move the entry door, move the handicapped bathroom to the inside. Then you got your 20 feet. Oh, I see what you See, saying. I don't think, I think it's no, such I, a small yeah. point that, and to say you're looking at Main Street driving down, again, the Amherst Media Building has got an American elm tree planted on that northwest corner that eventually is going to be big. So I think, I don't understand, you know, you're, you're interpreting that as really a mass. Well, it's, I just don't get it. Really? The, okay. So that's but, how I feel about it. Yeah. All right. So, th those, and, um, and, and it, so when we get when we get to the, you know, findings and conditions, um, you know, with the, some of the, the some of the bylaw requires harmonious relationships between the buildings on the site, I have a hard time yeah. saying that that's a harmonious relationship. But it's on the north side that only the tenants are going to see. Unless you happen to walk up the sidewalk and stop and actually look well, at that's, it. That's not the concern. You could remove that north piece of the existing house and that would not change my concern. Okay. Okay, um, other board members, Tom. Thanks everyone, thanks for the presentations. Um, no, I, I, I'm, um, I'm in the same camp and I've been that way for a while with, with Doug and, and I think Janet somewhat, and the, and the notion I think John of the um, this quality of looming has a little bit to do with the the clearance of space, right? The twenty feet or twelve feet. I think it's the scale of it vertically, and its proportion to the building in front of it. And I think that that's something we've had a problem with, and it's visibility and there's no effort to break down that facade either. It just is a massive wall and the roof line is continuous. And I think that's where the presence of it as this kind of looming wall is something that I think is, um, it, it feels like it's um, confrontational with this smaller building that's in front of it. And I think that's the, that's the tone and quality that it's giving. Um, and I think that's why um, and I'm someone who this would get referred to, thanks Doug, um, on the design review board, but um, it's something that I do have um, a concern about too, um, whether this does, if this is harmonious with the building next to it based on its its scale. So, um, but I mean, what, what I do think is, is impressive is how you've responded to all these other conditions. You know, I think the front facade it has had a huge um, improvement in changing the scale there. And I understand the sacrifices you have to make in square footage and um, room numbers to make that happen. Um, and I applaud you for that. And I think there's a lot of juggling around. I think people do have concerns with parking and I'm less in that camp. Um, I think people will figure out where to put a car if they have one. I think you're close enough to downtown, but I think, um, some effort to break that facade to, to make that not feel so, um, uh, to not make that scale shift so dramatic in just a short amount of feet. I think that's something that I'd, I'd like to see looked at. And like I said, I think you've done a great job breaking down the facade in other places and changing scale and adding um, elements that do change the scale, but uh, in that particular condition, I don't see that effort. If I may, just for a moment, um, pull up a Google Maps so that we could look up Gray Street and at the Tuttle Farms, <laughs> you know, house that was relocated there and the way that that building sits with its massing, because I think that this um, is similar. I think, you know, the difference in the roof heights is like 13 or 14 feet. 
Yeah, it'd be similar to that roof line going straight across. But again, all the trees are are going to be covering that roof pretty much. Those trees are almost as tall as the roof line itself. Yeah. I so measured them with, I put 10 foot pipes together and pushed them up along the trunk of the tree. They're like 34 feet. And I believe yeah. the highest peak is 41 feet, if I remember, Mike, or... Uh, I don't. I don't know that it's yeah, like. I'm pretty um, sure it's 41 feet on that okay. west end. So, if it's going to take a year to build, those trees are going to grow another two feet. So they're but, almost as high as the peak of the building. Though those are maple trees, which will probably reach 50 feet high, 50 foot height. The the red one in the in the photo there. Yeah, that's right. One. Yeah. Um, but yeah. if you just if you just in your mind keep this massing and scale. And I'm going to stop sharing this, and then I'm going to pull up the slide um, that we put together. I can remember where I put it. <clears throat> oh, I think I know, the other thing you look at is coming down Gray Street. You're looking at new building and new building, and they match. You know, you're looking at the same colors, the same three stories, etc. So, you know, look at it from different angles, and not just from that one angle yeah christine i think for me the it's the it's the the large roof expanse that's behind the house mm -hmm. and and the height of that gable end um but, you know if the building were, were further back it, it wouldn't be yeah. but that's exactly what you see on that slide that she had before that house that was moved from amherst college has a two-story and then the rest of that house is built up above it, almost exactly what you're looking at here on the other side of the street. Well, it's not actually the absolute elevation that I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the relative elevation to the house. All right. And, and that's, that's, you know, if, if the building were farther back, you wouldn't have that close juxtaposition of the three-story uh, pitched roof with the with the rather diminutive house. The house really feels tiny. Uh, so. Well, the peak on the front of that house, I believe is about 27, between 27 and 28 feet from finished grade. And again, I think we're looking at 41 feet because we have a wider building in the 712 pitch. Right. Um, are there other board members that would like to make a comment before we move to public comment, which I see one hand raised for? So, uh, Maria. I guess I'll just push one more idea, which is that, um, so if you look at it, I mean, uh, I'm not an urban planner, but if I look at it in the context of a larger lens, um, from the public faces, it really responds well to context. I agree that, I mean, like I said, there are some portions of the project that just aren't quite as successful as others. And that is the one part, the sort of um, canyon you've created on the north side existing. But, you know, like the suggestions you've made, Doug, without drastically changing this project, and I would definitely not want the project to not happen or to make major sacrifices because of this one portion that's not necessarily the public space. It's something that the, you know, of course I want everyone, even the people using the space to, you know, have the best experience, but that is the one sort of not as ideal um, experience, I guess, when you walk through the site. And so if you weigh that to everything else, as far as like the accommodations they've made to maximize parking, make the scale on the two streets match the opposite you know the, the the buildings on gray street the buildings across from on main street i feel like those are the more critical elevations um not that you know it means i get sloppy in other areas but without a drastic change um you know you're not going to change the scale of that that space that dramatically um if you gain that you know the the extra feet you were saying, Doug, where if you, you um, push the parking back or decrease parking, it's it seems to me a little bit like a is is it worth that kind of sacrifice for that one experience in that slot, you know? Um, so I I I'm kind of torn about that. Um, 
again, I feel like overall the project has done a lot of uh, amendments and edits to make it better and better. But to solve that one, that's almost, I don't want to say redesign, but that's a, it's a major design change. And so I'm a little wary about that. I mean, if it's something like just add some more fake dormers on the roof, that doesn't really resolve it either. It may visually slightly from when you're really far away from the project, when you're up close, you're never going to see that roof. So if you're like way over by, um, maybe down by uh, Bruno looking at an angle and you catch that roof, you might see the dormers in the distance, but when you're on those two streets, um, you're kind of either passing quickly if you're in a car or the roofs are so high that you really, you know, won't catch that sort of um, experience. So unless you're walking through the canyon, yes, it will always feel looming. I feel like even if you added 10 feet, it will still feel looming. So, yeah, I, I'm torn about it. I, I, because I, I think this is a really reasonable project for the space that it has available. Um, so I guess I'm just repeating myself, but I just wanna throw it out there that you know what we're trying to achieve may not be attainable without a drastic change. So, um, in, anyway. in any drastic change, just to remind you, any further reduction in units, you know, if we lose another three units, you lose an affordable unit. Um, and really only the only, only way to accomplish, Doug, what you're, if I'm reading you right, is to lower that roof line or something, then you're losing units. And, you know, the economy of scale you build up is much cheaper than building out. Yep. And, you know, that's the whole reason a three story. It just makes economical sense and it gives good space to the tenants versus a knee wall or something like that. And it mimics, you know, the building that we did last year. Okay. All right. Um, board members, I don't see any more hands at this time. So we'll go to public comment. Pam. Um, uh, a Takun is the first hand that I see. Takun. So if you would please give us your name and your address. Hello. Hello. Uh, Pam, I think he left the attendees. I think he did too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, Gabrielle. We have Gabrielle. All right. Hi, give Gabrielle. Name and address, please, Gabrielle. Hi, Gabrielle Gould. I'm speaking as the executive director of the Business Improvement District. Um, I just would like to make a couple of points about this particular project. As uh, we all know, we remain in a housing crisis in Amherst and building density in our downtown is an imperative goal for, I think, all of us in the master plan. Um, especially down on Main Street, we've got a lot of uh, retail, some of our only remaining retail along Main Street. So this kind of density really helps those businesses stay. We have a business on Main Street that's considering a brick and mortar restaurant as well. Um, and this would help them sort of, you know, strive to achieve that goal. I'd also like to just say that uh, Robleski seems to be, for all intents and purposes, a really remarkable landlord. His buildings have a lot of integrity. They're very, very well uh, kept. And um, he is a stellar community member as well as a great member of the bid. Um, the bid has full support behind this project. We're very excited about it. Uh, we love its proximity to the bus stops. Um, I also live in the neighborhood. So as a resident, I can say that I drive by that property uh, several times a day. Uh, never is it uh, full of parking um, ever. Um, and I think that that is because it is within walking distance to town. And when you look at the cost of gas and used cars right now to have uh, people be able to live in our downtown and not have to drive their cars or not have to own cars, I think it's going to be a really important thing to bring people to our community and into our downtown. Uh, I just wanted to say that I think it looks great. I've looked at all the elevations. I've driven around. I even went up to the Dickinson Museum last week and took a look from there. And uh, John, I think it's a great project and I really hope that it passes. We need the housing desperately and we, ne we need the density in order for economic development to thrive and for our downtown to remain and become more vibrant. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. Okay, I don't see any more hands raised in the attendees. Uh, Mr. Mr. Robleski, your hand. Mr. Marshall, excuse me, Dorothy Pam's hand oh. has popped up. 
Okay, all right. So John, we'll hold on you and let Dorothy speak. Hi, Dorothy, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can. <laughs> Okay, so I, I want to say that it's clear that uh, a lot of thought has gone into this project. Um, and um, I wasn't able to tell from some of the drawings how much the public space was for the tenants. Um, when I looked at one drawing and I saw the patio, it looked like a very small thing, but it was near a larger green area. So I, it just wasn't clear to me how much space the tenants could actually access. Um, I, I am concerned that what's happening in that small area is getting denser and denser. Um, you know, we have the wonderful Dickinson houses, we have the um, Amherst Women's Club, we have the former Boys and Girls Club, and then we have, as Mr. Robleski mentioned several times, the possibility of the Amherst Media building, which I don't personally think belongs in that space. Um, and then we have the houses that are on Gray Street, which have been brought in uh, as historical remnants. And so, um, that's our historical downtown, um, a very, very important area for the uh, finances uh, and economic development of the town in terms of that's what people come from around the world to see. So um, I could see that there's been a lot of care and attention. Um, uh, I, I just would just to say if there's a way to put in a little bit more green space and perhaps to make it uh, not quite so clouded and crowded. It looks as, as dense as, as what I would expect, say, in a much bigger town, uh, a town like a subway, um, kind of like parts of Queens. Um, and it seemed a little bit dense for Amherst. But I, you know, I do want to applaud Mr. Robleski's sincerity and his, his uh, hard work on trying to make a plan that will work for him and the town of Amherst. But um, if there is a possibility of just putting a little bit more green space in there, I would really love that. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, or thank you, Dorothy. Um, uh, let's see, so that was the last hand in our public attendees. John, do you wanna say something? Yeah, just um, a couple of things, I guess. Uh, as far as you know, public comment and so forth, I mean, all the neighbors were notified, of course, as abutters, and part of the requirements was that I notify any existing tenants um, so I did notify all 35 tenants by posting a notice in the common hallways, um, I think seven or eight days prior to the meeting with the meeting link and so forth on it. So, you know, everybody knows about it and apparently there's not much public comment about it. Um, and what Ms. Pam just said, we are maintaining that whole corner. I mean, I could have built up close to Main Street and got rid of all that green space, you know, and proposed something like that, but that wasn't my intent. I think my intent was very sincere as you're driving into town, you're approaching a cultural district, a historic district. So leave that corner the way it is. You know, we got a new building there that mimics uh, the architecture style and so forth. It blends in well. Then you look at the historic building next door. You go up Main Street, you're going to see Amherst Media eventually, and then you're into the, the view of the Hills House and so forth. I, I just think the intent and, you know, this plan the way it is has a lot of green space. It's got 4,300 space, 4,300 square feet more that we could have covered that we're leaving as a green space. And just that whole front corner with mature trees and green space and so forth and access to the bus stop, a sidewalk to Main Street. Just, I think it makes sense. And I think that's what the town should be looking at coming into town. And, you know, you're going to look at other parcels probably down the road if the RG district allows denser housing that you're going to run into the same situation. And how do you weigh, you know, infill with existing buildings and, and new buildings? You know, you got to kind of give a little bit somewhere, I think, to make everything work and have a nice site design. And I think... And that's what I actually tried to do here. And I think, I think it, it'll work pretty well. And I will guarantee it'll work pretty well as long as I'm alive. All right, thank you. Okay, so board members, um, I, I suggested I'd like to make a motion and, and I guess I'll go ahead and make that. If, you, uh, if you're not in support of it, you can vote against it. and make a motion to approve the project this evening is probably the alternative. 
Um, so I will move that we uh, refer this project to the design review board and to the local historic district commission for their opinions about the project. And that would involve, that would include continuing the hearing this evening. Uh, and I would look to Chris for a date certain on which to do that. Um, so that's my motion. Does anybody want to second that or not? Tom? Can I, if I second that, do we have discussion? Sure. Okay, I second. Okay. All right, so we do have a motion on the table. Um, anybody want to make a comment? Tom? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm curious, Doug, because um, I agree with you, I think it would be wise to take this step. I'm wondering what, um, what that's going to add to this process like what what do you what are your um what, what kind of outcomes do you hope to get and an approval from those groups i mean like i said because i'm on one of them so i'm <laughs> curious what's going to happen um as this gets passed on so what are you hoping to hear back from those particular groups well i guess um you know if they come back and say we're generally in support of this project i will conclude that i'm an outlier <laughs> Uh, that I'm overly sensitive to the adjacent masses of the building and, you know, we'll just go forward. Um, if they come back and say, yeah, we think this is a really objectionable project, um, then I think we would need, to, you know, I would hope we would talk to Mr. Robleski more about making more substantive changes. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I had, that's that's what I would hope for, and and the sense is that it wouldn't go to these either of those two organizations or groups on its own, right? We would need a. That's would right. Need us. That's right. Um, you know, we're not in a local historic district, um, so the, the local historic district commission doesn't have any jurisdiction or obligation to look at it, and um, it's not in the design review boards area. Yeah. Um, I simply thought of them because we have the option of applying the design review board criteria. Um, and who better to consider those criteria than the board itself? Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Robleski, we'll get to you, Johanna, next. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I understand you do have the power to, um, I'm not sure if you have the power to send this to the board or just to look at those standards according to 11.2420. It says within the BN district, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if the board deems the proposal likely to have a significant impact on its surroundings, be permitted to use the design principles and standards set forth in the design thing. So I think you have to agree that for some reason that this has a significant impact on its surroundings. And I don't think you have to look at just that house. You had to look at the neighborhood surroundings as I'm assuming that's what that means. And again, I kind of looked at those and I don't see any big issues with them, but to postpone this again, to another committee, um, I have financing in place, you know, and it's, I understand you know, probably don't care about that, but with today's interest rates and so forth, that would have a major, major impact. Okay. So, you know, please take that into account, read that section over, maybe um, Chris Restrup may um, have a comment on that. Um, and that's the way I read it. You can go by those standards, but I'm not sure you can review, refer it to that committee. All right, thank you. Uh, Johanna. Thank you very much. Um, I guess I understand Doug and Tom, the concerns about massing in relation to the existing house. I, um, it's not a huge concern for me. I think it's not, I don't think it, 
you know, it's not orders of magnitude in terms of jarring. The architecture is similar. And ultimately for me, the, the housing crisis in town is very real. And it seems like John has engaged with that trade-off of massing versus housing and has decided to prioritize the number of units, which honestly is a conclusion that is consistent with what, what I think the town needs to be doing. Um, and then I am concerned about just adding additional bureaucracy to a project that has been vetted by sending it to two other committees. So at this point, I would not be inclined to support your motion. Okay. All right. Um, let's see, I don't see any hands at all. Um, why don't, since we have the motion on the floor, why don't we go ahead and vote on that? And then I suspect we'll go on to another motion. Um, so Maria. Uh, no. Okay. Um, Tom. No. Uh, Andrew. No. And Johanna. No. Okay. And I'm an I. So the motion fails. Um, does anybody have another motion? Or do we want to have more discussion before we move to the next motion? Johanna. I move to, um, you're, I hope I don't screw this up, but a move, uh, approve the plans as proposed, um, say that they comply with section 11.24 and close the public hearing. Okay. Uh, Chris, does that meet the motion requirements that we're likely to have? I would um, encourage you to go through the findings that we've already prepared. I don't know if you all had a chance to look at them, but they were included in the packet. So rather than the blanket statement that we use for smaller projects, I think this project probably um, you know, deserves to be looked at carefully with those um, findings. And then also um, consider the conditions, which haven't been reviewed yet. So I wondered if you wanted to review the conditions and the findings and then um, vote. OK, so we thank you. Uh, we have Johanna's motion on the floor. I think we should get a second. And then we can go ahead and go into the findings and conditions. Would anybody like to second that motion from Johanna to approve the project and uh, close the hearing? Uh, Maria, I see your hand. Looks like you second. slightly beat Andrew. <laughs> second. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Chris uh, or Pam, can one of you bring up the findings? Mm -hmm. That was in the packet, Chris, is that correct? That's right, yep. It's right after the town engineer's letter. Yeah. Um, may I also make a point that um, there are five of you here tonight and the site plan review needs um, a majority of the five, which would be three. And the special permit, which you'll be considering later um, to extinguish the previous special permits requires a vote of five. So for this portion, the site plan review only requires a vote of three, affirmative. Okay. Do you want me to start reading these? I guess so. Okay, and if my voice fails, maybe Nate or Pam could, um, could take my place. Um, <clears throat> 
So uh, the board found under section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw as follows. 11.2400, the project is in conformance with all appropriate provisions of the zoning bylaw and the goals of the master plan. The project is requesting waivers from the requirements for the size of parking spaces to provide compact spaces in place of standard spaces for a certain percentage of parking spaces and is presenting the information to support an alternative ratio for the number of parking spaces. Um, and I would pause after each one in case anybody has a comment. Maria? Should we do a similar condition like we did for uh, the adjacent project where we ask, you know, if they can sort of give a update um, on how the parking's going? Did we do that for the first project? I think we did, right? Um, I think we did. And that would be part of the conditions. So oh, um, right now we're review reviewing findings. So, um, okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry. All right. Um, so 11.2401, the town, town amenities and abutting properties will be protected through minimizing detrimental or offensive actions. The proposed use of the property, residential and office uses, is unlikely to create detrimental or offensive actions. These uses are both allowed in the BN zoning district by site plan review. 11.2402, abutting properties will be protected from detrimental site characteristics resulting from the proposed use. Lights will be downcast and or shielded. 11.2403, provision of adequate recreational facilities, open space and amenities has been addressed because there is adequate space on the site for recreation. 40% of the site will be landscaped and drawings presented on June 15th, 2022 showed locations for proposed outdoor recreation and sitting locations. Do you wanna change that to June 29th? Um, we could, yeah. ex except that the actual plan was shown on the 15th. And did you dis do you feel that you discussed it enough tonight? You could say both dates, actually, June, 20, June 15th and June 29th. Do you want to do that? Yeah, it feels to me like we got much more detailed information tonight than we did on the 15th. Okay, so we'll scratch that and put the 29th. All right. Um, 11.2410, unique or important natural, historic, or scenic features will be protected. Previously demolished structures on the site were reviewed by the Historical Commission prior to demolition. 11.2411, the project provides adequate methods of refuse disposal as described in the management plan. Trash will be collected in an enclosed room at the, end, at the rear of the new building and will be picked up by USA Waste twice a week. Um, should we be referencing a specific hauler? It seems to me we ought to be just saying it will be picked up twice a week and remove the That's right. reference to the hauler since that yeah. could change over time. Okay. 11.2412, um, the project will be connected to town sewer and water. 11.2413, the proposed drainage system within and adjacent to the site will be adequate to handle the stormwater. A stormwater drainage report has been submitted. The town engineer submitted a letter of comment dated June 16th, 2022. It contains comments, but no serious concerns about the stormwater drainage report. I think there was a comment about some inconsistency between a plan and what was written in the text, but essentially he agreed with the report. 11.2416, adjacent properties will be protected by... Oh, min oh, oh, oh sorry, did I skip one? Yeah. 2414. Four. I'm sorry. 11.2414, provision of adequate landscaping has been addressed. The project includes new plantings on site as well as preservation of some of the existing mature trees. 11.2415, the soil erosion control methods appear to be adequate to control soil erosion both during and after construction. The town engineer submitted a letter of comment dated June 16th, 2022. It does not contain comments or concerns about soil erosion control methods. 
11.2416, adjacent properties will be protected by minimizing the intrusion of various nuisances. A construction logistics plan is required to be submitted prior to the issuance of a building permit. 11.2417, adjacent properties will be protected from the intrusion of lighting because a condition of the permit will require that exterior lighting be downcast and or shielded and not shine onto adjacent properties. 11.2418 is not uh, applicable. The property is not located in the FPC flood prone conservancy zoning district. 11.2419 is not applicable. The property does not have wetlands on site or within 100 feet of the site. 11.2420 within the BL, BVC, BN, COM, OP, LI, and PRP districts and any residential zoning district for the project in question occurs within the boundaries of a National Historic Registered District. The permit granting authority shall, if it deems the proposal likely to have a significant impact on its surroundings, be permitted to use the design principles and standards set forth in sections 3.2040 and 3.2041, not one through nine, to evaluate the design of the proposed architecture and landscape alterations. These um, principles and standards were included in your development application report and you've had an opportunity to review those. <clears throat> Would you like to review them now or do you want to just say that you've had an opportunity to look at them? I suspect we should just say that we've had an opportunity to review them. Okay. 11.2421, the development is reasonably consistent with respect to setbacks, placement of parking, landscaping and entrances and exits with surrounding buildings and development. The development complies with the dimensional requirements of the zoning bylaw. 11.2422, not applicable. There are no steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes and wetlands on site. 11.2423, there's more than one building on the site and the buildings relate harmoniously to each other in architectural style, site location and building exits and entrances. And the reason I highlighted this was because I think this was a subject of discussion during these um, meetings. I don't know if you wanna talk about that now or if you feel like you've talked about it enough already. I guess my sense is that the majority of the board is ex accepts the uh relationship of the two of the buildings on the site and would support this statement? Do, do, are there any board members that would disagree with that? Okay. Okay, um, 11.2424, screening has been provided as appropriate via a hedge along the Northern property line adjacent to the parking lot on 446 Main Street and via a white vinyl fence around the parking lot that currently serves 462 Main Street. I would also add, since we've seen the drawings tonight, that um, the screening has been added for, uh, for the HVAC um, the mechanical units. units. Yep. Um, let's see, 11.2430, the site has been designed to provide for the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement, both within the site and in relation to adjoining ways and properties. The parking lot has been carefully designed to allow backup and turning movements and pedestrian circulation. The portion of the parking lot that lies north of the new building is proposed to be one way. 11.2431, the existing curb cut on the property from Gray Street will be relocated and improved. The existing curb cut on the property from Main Street will be retained. 11.2432, the location and design of parking spaces, bicycle racks, <clears throat> drive aisles, loading areas, and sidewalks has been provided in a safe and convenient manner. 11.2433 is not applicable. Provision for access to adjoining properties is not an issue here. 11.2434, where possible, driveways located in commercial and business districts shall be located opposite each other. 
the driveway into the property from Gray Street in the BN district will be approximately opposite the driveway on the opposite side of the street at 14 Gray Street in the RG district. 11.2435 is not applicable. There are no joint access driveways needed between adjoining properties. 11.2436, the requirement for submittal of a traffic impact statement will be waived. However, the applicant did submit a statement from Berkshire Design with estimated trip generation figures. And that may be something you want to talk about. Do you want to talk about that? Um, whether you want to... Uh, waive that traffic impact statement. Any board members have a comment on that? Okay. And the last one is 11.2437. That's not applicable because that relates to what is required in a traffic impact statement. And if you're not requiring one, then you wouldn't have to follow those requirements. Okay. So it sounds like um, these- Sounds like we're gonna waive them. And those findings with those two notes are acceptable to most of you, to the majority of you? I think that is the case. Okay, I'm gonna go through the conditions then and we yeah. can um, craft a condition. It's possible that I missed this um, when I was reviewing the previous, um, the previous decision and I wonder if Nate might possibly be able to do some research to find the previous decision and find out what the wording of that um, condition was with regard to coming back in 18 months to review um, the parking. So I'm going to make that request of Nate if he could do that from um, where he sits. So in, in terms of the conditions, general conditions, um, the first one is the development shall be built substantially in accordance with the plans submitted to the planning board and approved on whatever date they're approved on. And insubstantial field changes may be approved by the building commissioner. Number two, the development shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on whatever date you approve it on. Number three, parking shall be managed substantially in accordance with the parking management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on whatever date. Um, and Mr. Robleski has submitted a couple of management plans, a couple of parking management plans. And so we would take the latest one and I would put that date in here as well. Um, number four, upon a change of ownership or if the property is no longer managed by John Robleski or Vertex Real Estate, the new owner and or manager shall submit a new management plan to the planning board at a public meeting for its review and approval. The purpose of the meeting shall be for the board to determine whether conditions of the permit are being complied with and whether any modification to the site plan review approval or management plan is required. I guess I'm missing number five here. Um, so the numbering will have to change, but what is labeled here as number six, um, all exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant, exterior lighting shall be downcast, shielded and shall not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. Um, number seven, the property shall be registered and permitted in accordance with the Amherst Residential Rental Property Bylaw. Loss or suspension of a rental permit shall constitute a violation of this condition. Number eight, changes to the project and or substantial changes to any approved site plans or to the exterior of the buildings, building shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of the submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the change and or to determine whether the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require modification of the special permit or site plan review approval. In this case, there wouldn't be a special permit, so we would scratch that. Because the special permit has to do with extinguishing previous special permits. Number nine, landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the landscape plan and once installed shall be continually maintained. All disturbed areas shall be loamed and seeded unless otherwise specified. Number 10, one hard copy and one digital copy of the final revised plans shall be submitted to the planning department. Number 11, the office space shall be available to be rented by a member of the public and shall not be used solely as the management office for the proposed mixed use building. Um, again, we have a problem with numbering here. We're missing 12 and 13, but we'll fix that. 
Um, and number 14 is listed as um, the applicant will investigate the installation of solar panels and install solar panels to determine. That, that yeah. That Shouldn't we just in, in, investigate the installation of solar panels to determine if, if feasible? To determine if feasible, yes. So we've got a phrase, an extra phrase in there. The applicant will investigate the installation. Hold on, hold, hold on, Chris. Uh, Andrew has his hand up. Oh, yeah. No, I was just curious with this one. Like, what what's if it is feasible? Point? What does that mean? What does it what's mean? The, yeah, what's the point of this, actually? Yeah. I mean, if we fix the wording to just look into it, I mean, why would we require that? Uh, John? I Yeah, um, the building I did last year, I oversized the, uh, the system there. And my intent was um, to provide enough power to take care of all the common electrical expenses, you know, heat in the hallways, the mechanical room, the exterior lighting and so forth. Um, so I have 94 solar panels on that building that I feel will take care of any additional lighting in this additional building uh, uh, electrical load also as far as the common areas. So, so there are 94 so would, panels. So would you object to this condition? I don't, I wouldn't say I object to it. Um, but you're unlikely to ever put panels on this new building. No, I wouldn't say that. Um, I guess I would have to look at it and see how much of a bill I have, you know, for all this additional stuff. And, you know, you got to realize that the, the payback on those, like it cost us like 26 cents a kilowatt hour for all the electric in our homes. When you average out all of the whole list of charges they have, take the last number and divide it by kilowatts. They allow when you get these reserve renewable energy credits, REC, um, they pay you back at 10 point something cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so, you you know, it's going to take a long time for it to pay for itself, but it is paying for the actual electric that's being used. So, um, so I guess I would look at it depending on what the numbers are. So with the, the sentence reading now, the applicant will investigate the installation of solar panels to determine if feasible. That's a reasonable condition to leave in there. I, I think so. Okay. Um, one one question, uh, John, is the roof of your building likely to be structurally adequate for panels in any case? Yeah, we went through that on the uh, the first design, and it's not a big deal to have the truss system engineered to allow for that. So we would probably do that, whether we did it or not just a matter of some extra loading on the uh, design of the panel, of the design of the trusses. So it's not a big deal. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, I just like the applicant is encouraged to investigate. I, I, and I mean, again, it doesn't seem to have teeth. And even as it's proposed, that would, I guess we would, we would expect John to be able to furnish some sort of proof of, of reaching out to somebody. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I get the spirit of it, but you know, I just don't want to get some John caught up in some legalese here where he made a phone call that that doesn't honor this appropriate. Well, I'm, I'm wondering actually if it would be, it sounds like it might be acceptable to John if we said that the roof structure shall be designed to accommodate solar panels and just leave it at that. And if whether he decides or some future owner decides to put the panels on, at least it's ready for that. Kristen, Christine? Solar ready. You just said the words, but in different order. It's a solar yeah, I, ready. Roof. I had those yeah. words in my head and I wasn't sure whether that's actually a, enough of a, of a, a known term to, uh, to use in, as a shorthand. John, would you be okay with us uh, insisting that the roof is adequate for installation of panels? Yes, I'd be fine with that. Okay. Thank you. 
So this will read the roof structures shall be designed to be solar ready. I would I would be more explicit that it should will be designed to uh, support the installation of solar photovoltaic panels. Johanna. Um, I don't know whether this needs to be in the conditions, but we want to make sure the not only the roof structure, but also the electrical panels. Like essentially the whole structure just needs to be solar ready from all systems, including the roof and the electrical system. How is it? Is it prohibitive to switch out a solar to out a, out a panel when you decide to put up, you know, it seemed like it's prohibitive to ever replace the roof structure, but you could replace a, an electric bolt panel when you're ready to do your panels or your solar installation. That's true. Okay, so scratch the electrical panel, but leave the roof. Uh, John? Yeah, just to explain that, um, the owner's panel in the building we did last year and the owner's panel that's being uh, designed for this building are a three-phase uh, 208 volt panel and very acceptable to any uh, solar array and um, system that they have. It was no problem adding it to the three-phase uh, panels. So should not be a problem. Thank you. Okay, um, so this seems like a good place to put in whatever condition we want to about um, coming back in 18 months to look at the parking issue. And I wonder if Nate has come up with the wording that we may have used last time or not. Pineda is still here. Yeah, sorry, I, you know, it's funny. I, um, I was looking at one other SPR decision, but I, I actually haven't found the language as being a condition. Um, it may have been something that was discussed, but I don't see that it was actually um, formalized as a condition. I think that was my memory as well. Yep, that it was discussed during the public hearing, but it wasn't actually made a condition. Right. Maria. I'm fine with that, if that was how we kind of left it, because I can't remember. I was trying to dig through all our old packets to find this approval for the, the previous project, and I can't find it either. But that, that sounds I, fine. Actually, you know, I just, I just, so I just found it. There was a few. Oh. You know, there's an amended SPR, there's two right SPRs and then an amended SPR. Um, so on the amended SPR, sorry, it was um, 2020-05. It said, uh, the applicant shall come back to the planning board at a public meeting 18 months after the issuance of a certificate of occupancy uh, for the new building to review the parking plan, the number of spaces provided, and to examine whether the six potential reserved parking spaces shown on the site plan should be put to use to meet the parking needs of the tenants. So I guess there is a, uh, there was a condition to that effect. You wanna put in a condition to that effect here? Yeah, I think that would be useful. Okay, so yeah. Nate, can you email me, can you like email me that condition and I'll include it? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll get that in a minute uh, to me. And yeah. am I right? We don't really have any reserve parking areas anymore. I, no, I assume the, the ones that were in the original building site plan have been preempted or otherwise occupied. And, and this new plan doesn't have any identified. Mr. Robleski did identify two spaces during the June 15th meeting that were north of the main parking area, um, sort of just to the west of the building that was built a couple of years ago. But there were just two spaces there. And then there was this other plan showing shadow parking towards the front of the building, but I think that people may be reluctant to put in um, that parking. I did send that plan to Nate and Pam earlier in the meeting, which I think is why that my screen froze and I was left out of the meeting for a while. But um, I don't know if you want to bring that ghost parking plan up, if Nate can bring it up. But you'd have to stop sharing the conditions in order to do that, wouldn't you? Mm. So, yeah. 
I don't know if we want to go back to that, but I will put in the condition about parking and what should be, so what, I guess the question is, what would be the solution? If you go back and look at it in 18 months, what are you going to do about it? You've got these two spaces. Well, I, I guess I assumed that the primary purpose to come back was to educate the board about how, how what we've approved is working mm -hmm. so, that, so that we have information for future reviews. Um, I mean, if Maria? Yeah, like a lot of uh, board members expressed concern about the percentage of compact spaces and about um, whether, um, wasn't there some shadow parking proposed, like whether those are gonna be needed. So those were the two pieces that were questioned, I think, during the comments. Mm -hmm. I don't have any others. I think. All right, well, we'll have to look at the wording that Nate just read and figure out how we can um, make it best suit this current are, are there Are the two spaces that you remember at the sort of north end of the main parking area still available? Yes. They take um, away from the green space up there, but they are still available. Yep. Um, would it be reasonable just to reference those and stop there? I think I think you're right that that I at least would be reluctant to insist on parking in the front, you know, on the south side of the house. Okay. Yeah. I will reference those. All right. Shall we move on to the affordable conditions? Yes. And I wonder if Nate would mind reading these um, conditions having to do with affordable units, because he's the expert in affordable housing in our small um, department here. Sure. The, um, so, you know, this, um, this project does trigger inclusionary zoning. And so Article 15 of the zoning bylaw. And so these conditions have become um, somewhat standard when projects uh, include affordable units. So most of these um, you know, will be repetitive project to project. Uh, things might change in terms of the actual number of units or, you know, uh, bedroom counts, but in terms of how it's organized, it becomes, um, you know, a, a standard format. So um, uh, condition 15, at least 12% of the dwelling units, three units shall be and shall remain affordable in perpetuity and shall be marketed to eligible households whose annual income may not exceed 80% of the area median income, uh, AMI, adjusted for household size as determined by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, quote, these are the affordable units. Uh, subject to approval by DHCD, the affordable units and the remaining units shall be eligible to be included in the town's subsidized housing inventory, uh, the SHI as maintained by DHCD. Um, article or um, number 16, as defined by this Article 12 um, definitions, the zoning by a lot. Affordable housing units are units which may only be rented or purchased by families or households whose annual incomes adjusted for family size do not exceed the limit for the maximum annual income for low income families or households, 80% um, of the median income for Amherst, as calculated by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development or any successor agency and are eligible and countable for the purposes of the Commonwealth's 40B subsidized housing inventory or its successor. Uh, 17, with a total of 23 units proposed, a total of three units shall be affordable units as defined by Article 12. Um, these affordable units shall include, um, and usually in this section, we might, uh, we'd enumerate uh, the bedroom sizes. So, um, and the inclusionary zoning says the units would be comparable um, in you know size, bedroom count, um, you know material and design as the market rate units. So um, typically it'd be a proportional rate. You know if there's ones, twos, and three bedrooms, we'd have a proportional rate of affordable bedroom sizes as well. I don't know if Mr. Robleski has spelled that out, but if he has, maybe he could state what it is here. Yes, John. You're muted. Yeah, I believe we um, designated, and the numbering has changed, so I'm not sure what the number is right now. Um, but yes, one of the first floor units on the center, the east 
entry door near the laundry room. Uh, the one bedroom unit there is uh, an affordable unit and also the ADA unit. So it's very accessible um, to the laundry and direct access from the outside and uh, so forth. Then upstairs in the northeast corner, there's a studio apartment um, that I think we've indicated is affordable. And then on the third floor, a one bedroom in the northwest corner uh, would be a one bedroom. All right, sure. So this condition, thanks, John. This condition would read uh, these affordable units will include, you know, one studio unit and two one bedroom units. Right. For a total of three. Do we still have 23 units total or I thought that it was 24 or 25, but maybe not. No, I went from 27 and we lost four units by eliminating the third floor and the studio next to the uh, office on the first floor when we made the whole first floor in the front office space. So uh, we went from 27 total units uh, residential to 23. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and the second part of this condition reads, if the total number of units changes, the applicant will be required to return to the planning board for review and approval of the change, including a change in the number of affordable units. Condition 18, the affordable units and 80 units shall not be segregated from the market rate units. And in accordance with Article 15, inclusionary zoning of the zoning bylaw, the affordable units shall be dispersed throughout the development and shall be comparable to the market rate units in terms of quality of design, materials, and general appearance of their architecture and landscape. Uh, condition 19, the applicant shall submit a local action unit application to DHCD under the local initiative program, enter into a rental regulatory agreement with DHCD in the town and comply with all DHCD requirements so as to ensure that the affordable units will be included in the DHCD subsidized housing inventory for the town. Uh, number 20, the affordable units are to remain affordable in perpetuity. Subject to DHCD approval, this requirement shall be included in the regulatory agreement. The affordability requirement shall remain in, in effect in perpetuity, even if the requirement is not included in the regulatory agreement or if the agreement is terminated. Uh, number 21, affordable units shall be marketed and rented to income eligible households in accordance with DHCD regulations and guidelines for the local initiative program, the guidelines which require the approval by DHCD of an affirmative fair housing marketing plan. The costs associated with the development and implementation of the marketing plan, including advertising and processing for the affordable units shall be borne by the applicant. Number 22, subject to the approval of DHCD, a qualified agent shall be engaged by the applicant to administer the initial marketing and lottery for the affordable units and to maintain a waiting list for subsequent rentals in compliance with the income eligibility requirements for tenants of the affordable units. And so, you know, the last few conditions, you know, the town, we're a part of the regulatory agreement. So we, you know, we assist the applicant in submitting uh, the paperwork to the local initiative program and um, in the regulatory agreement. We do not take part uh, um, with the marketing of the affordable units. So it's not something the town gets involved with unless there's an issue. We really aren't, um, supposed to do any of the marketing. Um, so, you know, um, if, if it's new to John, you know, I can, we can work, you know, Tom Reedy is familiar with it um, and we can work together, but, you know, really the town. So I think sometimes people think that the town will do the marketing or do the income eligibility review. And it's not the town that does that because really we're part of the a legal entity to the regulatory agreement. Um, our, uh, condition number 23, as allowed under applicable law and for no more than 70% of the affordable units, the applicant shall provide a local preference category for those eligible for local preference who in the initial lease up uh, live in the community, is a municipal employee, works at a business in the community and or has children in the schools of the community uh, or other category of local preference as defined by the state agency providing financing. And May this I say something about that one? Sure. Um, so this is something that the planning board can choose to do or not do. And you can only do it for the first lease up. But if you think it's important to make these units affordable to people who already have a relationship with the community, this would be a condition that you would want to uh, include. Mm -hmm. 
and we have to justify it to DHCD. So um, 70% is the maximum. So that means that, um, you know, 70% of the units could be reserved for local preference. Uh, when they do the marketing, they have a separate, separate pool of applicants that would meet this requirement and be drawn on. Um, but we first have to justify to the state that we have a need and demand for that 70%. So it's not, you know, we can make okay. it a condition and then we can propose it to the state and they, you know, it can be a discussion point if we can't meet that 70%. So. So the way this is re written, it looks like you could leave it in here and then it's 0%. Right. Because it's, it just has to be no more than 70. It could be n nothing. That's and right. And some people think it's discriminatory to have this condition and that you shouldn't limit it to only people who already have a relationship with the town because there may be other people of diverse, you know, ethnic groups or whatever that um, may want to live here who may not already be here or may not already work here. So this is a kind of controversial condition, but um, we've been including it in all of our affordable um, developments and in this kind of situation where affordable units are included. So I guess we would recommend that you include it, but I'm just saying we do get pushback from time to time saying that this can be discriminatory. I think, Doug, to your point, so we can have this be a condition, but if DHCD um, determines that we don't have the need or demand for the local preference, they might say, you know, they might say 50% of the units or 0%. So we, we actually can't, you know, say a percentage and unless we can. Oh, um, could, could we say something like uh, for no more than 70% uh, and as, but as a, a percentage as recommended or endorsed by DHCD? I think the first- it's, un, it's unclear here who decides what the percentage is. I think the permitting, the, yeah, the permitting board sets the preference level for percentage and then it's really the town um, tries to justify it. And if we can't, then DHCD could reduce it. So we never had a problem justifying 70%. So, you know, every time we have a project, we have to write a, you know, it's like a, you know, four to five page report explaining why we have that, um, how we can meet that percentage. Well, if this has been working for you, I guess I, I'll stop arguing, but I think right. uh, I don't understand. I mean, it looks like you, the landlord could just decide I'm not going to do that. And then it's 0% and he's met, you know, he's met this requirement. Yeah, yeah, I can see where we might need to reword that a little bit. Um, I mean, you might say something like, local affordable units shall be provided at an amount equal to DHCD's endorsement, but no more than 70%. Mm -hmm. Then it's DHCD that decides, not somebody else. I mean, I'm, uh, either either that the current wording or Doug, what you suggested would work for me. Okay. Well, I I don't know. I mean, John, how do you read that? It's it's Greek to me at this point. Um, I've never dealt with it, um, so I would look forward to Nate's help on it, I guess, or whatever agency I end up with, you know, handling the lottery and that type of thing. I think um, Barry has used somebody um, not familiar with anybody really. So I would look to the town's help in, uh, in getting through that. So okay. the wording to me, I, I just don't understand the wording aspect of it. So uh, Nate, I would look forward to, to working with you on that. I mean, it could be Doug that we just say um, as allowed under applicable law, the applicant shall provide a local preference category um, you know, usually we say the 70% just because that's the maximum, but. Um. This language was approved by our attorney from KP Law when we applied it to um, the project at 132 Northampton Road. 
Okay. So it has been right. reviewed by our attorney. All right. I'm. I'll. Let's move on. All right. Condition 24, the affordable unit shall be identified in an exhibit to the DHCD, DHCD regulatory agreement. Thereafter, if an affordable unit ceases to count as an affordable unit due to increases in tenant income, pursuant to DHC regulations and the provisions of the regulatory agreement, the next available market rate unit with the same number of bedrooms as the affordable unit in question shall be rented as an affordable unit. Uh, and so this is actually a, a good condition. Um, Earlier on, we would actually identify a unit and then we'd say that has to be affordable and sometimes a tenant may become over income or if they move out, they might not be able to rent it. And this allows essentially the affordable units to float, right, to move around the development, which is a benefit to the landlord and to the tenants um, in the future. Uh, condition 25, the regulatory agreement shall be approved by DHCD and reported at the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds prior to the issuance of any certificate of occupancy with a copy provided to the building commissioner. 26, the affordable unit shall be designated and shown on a floor plan provided to the planning department prior to the issuance of any building permit. Uh, in condition 27, the affordable unit shall be available um, shall be available, and the tenant selection process shall be in process at the time of any full or partial certificate of occupancy for completed units. However, at the discretion of the building commissioner, a certificate of occupancy may be issued and exclude the affordable units until the tenant selection process has been completed and inspection services had, has been provided documentation of the completed selection process. The affordable units shall be occupied at all times only by qualifying tenants in accordance with the regulatory agreement. Okay, I can pick up from here. Um, and I don't think we're gonna read all these construction um, conditions, but I do want to read the first one. Final details of contractor parking and other use of the VFW site will be worked out with the building commissioner prior to the issuance of a building permit as part of the approval of the construction logistics plan. And this was wording that was proposed by the building commissioner with regard to Mr. Robleski's um, statement that he wanted to use the VFW site for contractor parking. So, um, and then I don't think we need to read through all of the other construction uh, conditions because they're kind of boilerplate and you've seen them before. Um, so they're typical. I don't think there are any here that are not typical. So that okay. would be the end of the conditions. Great. Okay. So now I guess you can go back to your vote if you want to. Right. <laughs> So I think Johanna made the motion. I forget who seconded, but we we have the motion to Maria. approve and approve these findings and conditions. Uh, close the hearing. Uh, does anybody on the board want to say anything more before we vote? Okay, I don't see any hands. Uh, Maria. Approve. Tom? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Uh, Johanna? Aye. And I will abstain. Uh, four in favor, one opposed. I believe the motion passes. All right. Uh, no, no, no opposed, right? Four in favor, no opposed, I one abstain. Aye. And now you want to do the special permit? Right. So why don't we need to do that? Uh, John, I see your yeah, hand. I just want to say thank you for, you know, all your input and, and working together. And uh, I really do think this would be a nice project for that area of town or any area in town. So it's all about working together and little give and take. So thank you very much. Okay. All right. So we need... Uh, Let's see. The second, do we? Do you want to go right to a motion to? Uh, we're gonna. Um, let's see. I want to get my wording out again here.
All right, so we need a motion to re request a special permit or to approve a special permit to extinguish all the, the special permits associated with parcel 14B-66 and map 14B parcel 66 and 68 BN zoning district. Is it that simple, Chris? I think what you're doing is you're just um, extinguishing the special permits that relate to 446 Main Street because 462 has already been extinguished. Um, and so I can list the ones for 446 Main Street, which were in the development application report. Would you like me to do that? Yes, I certainly would. Okay, so there's a Zoning Board of Appeals special permit 9527, um, which was granted to Gerald and Barbara Gadera, um, a ZBA permit 9270, which was granted to David R. Tazunian and Mark Peterman, both doctors, um, a ZBA 9232, which was granted to Gordon and Barbara Freed for a professional office, ZBA 8325, which was a ZBA special permit granted to David R. Artizunian um, to convert a portion of the second floor to professional offices and um, CBA 79-57 issued to David Artizunian to establish a professional office and caretaker apartment. So you would be extinguishing those. And I did send them to you um, in an email so that you could see what the substance of those was if that was of interest to you. But um, I think you know they were described in your um, development application report enough so that you know what they're about. <clears throat> okay, thank you for that listing. Uh, Andrew? Thanks, Doug. <clears throat> I, I just had a quick question on the, on these uh, conditions, the 95, ZBA 9527. Well, I guess we're, we're basically saying that any of these that existed will no longer exist. Just make sure I'm following that, that correct. When you, when you say extinguish, that's what you mean. I was I trying to, Chris, do you it agree would, with that? It would no longer exist, except there were conditions that you might want to um, consider. And I put those in the development application report, and that might be what um, Andrew is referring to. Um, 9527 had hours of yeah. office use um, for the office. It said to not exceed 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. And there was another one in ZBA 92-70, which said, upon change of tenancy in the office, an updated management plan reflecting the new tenants shall be presented to the planning board at a public meeting prior to occupancy. So that means that every time the tenancy changes, you would want to see a management plan. I don't know if that's necessary because the things that would be allowed in the building as non-residential uses would all be things that would normally be allowed in the BN zoning district. But those are two um, conditions that you might consider attaching to this expunging of previous special permits if you wanted to. Okay, so if we took 9527 out, there would be no condition that restricts the hours of operation for the business? That's correct, yep. Okay, um, yeah, it sounds like probably a good thing to have in there. I was confused by the by the language as written here. Is that saying that 8 a.m. starting on 8 a.m. Monday to 8 p.m. on Friday? No. <laughs> or 8 a.m. I mean, you can't be open Saturday or and then also like you can't be open Saturday or Sunday. That's what it means. Yeah. OK. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think that's realistic to have restrictions like that. Yeah, I, I would agree. Well, I think a lot of those uses that are allowed under the BN now on that 3.35s or whatever the business section is, um, do have hours limitations in that section of the bylaw, which yeah, I guess would do. apply right to the, the BN zoning. That's right. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I'm not interested in creating them, but I would want to make sure that... Uh, yeah, I think they're all spelled out under each section of different offices, you know, different scenarios. Um, they list so many employees and office hours. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you really need, you know, to put that in there. So, Chris, you agree? I agree. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So we won't add any 
new conditions from the permits that are being extinguished. All right, so why don't I go ahead and make a motion to extinguish the permits that Chris listed and uh, via, I guess, a special permit that we're gonna approve this evening. So it's a new, so there'll be one new special permit that replaces all the old ones, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moved. Andrew? Second. Thank you. Any more discussion here at 10, at 9.59? Okay, why don't we go through that? Maria? Approve. Tom? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. All right. Um, I guess we already closed the public hearing, so there's really nothing else for us to do with Mr. Robleski and his team tonight. And yes, again, Tom. thank you very much and uh, look forward to moving on with this project and getting it done. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. All right, so it's now 10 o'clock and we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is old business. Chris, any old business? No old business, no. All right, looks like we have a couple of, at least one new business. Uh, temporary zoning uh, under Article 14 for permitting for certain uses during COVID emergency uh, proposal to make permanent. You wanna discuss that? We have Maureen Pollack who's ready to discuss that. And um, I guess it would be up to you to decide if you wanna hear about it tonight or if you wanted to put it off until the next opportunity would be July 20th. Um, is it time sensitive? Maureen, is this time sensitive? Um, um, hard to say. We would like to, uh, if possible, provide a, dr a draft language. Um, to the planning board and to the CRC in early September. Um, so. How about if you okay. just go through your slideshow and if the planning board has, you know, well, here's a suggestion that we could move through this relatively quickly um, rather than, you know, spending a lot of time on it. But Maureen has put a lot of time into it and so has Ben Breger. And so um, it would be, probably a good idea to hear the presentation. I don't think the presentation takes that long and then you could give initial reactions um, and then we would have something to go on for the next, um, for our next round, if, if that would be okay with you. That's fine with me. Uh, John, you still have your hand up, is that yeah. your legacy? Yeah, I just wondering um, the ANR, Christine, is that something that would get done tonight? Or do you think it needs to be done or can be done at the next meeting? Um, I don't think we need it done tonight, but I just want to throw that out there. Um, we could skip to the ANR. It's pretty simple. If Pam can bring it up, mm -hmm. if that is okay with Doug. Sure. So the time is 10.02 and we're moving on to an, an ANR. This a &R has to do with combining the two lots that Mr. Robleski owns on Main Street. Currently, they're two separate lots, and he would like to combine them for purposes of developing them. And um, to you, Pam has the um, actual a &R plan. Yeah, sorry. And there it is. And it's really just getting rid of that property line that's in between uh, the two properties. And um, it what you would be doing is acknowledging that this does not require subdivision um, approval. It is uh, approval not required. So you'd be authorizing your chairperson to sign on behalf of the planning board that no subdivision approval is required in this case. Does anyone object to my signing this? And we all agree it's an AM, it, that approval is not required. Please raise your hand at this time. I do not see any hands, Chris. I think we can okay. consider this uh, 
accepted by the board and I will schedule signing it with you. Okay. All right, and then Maureen can give her presentation. Thank you again. Thank you, John. Yeah, good night. Good night. Mm -hmm. Hi, Maureen. Okay. So Maureen, you can do this in eight minutes, right? Uh, well, well, let's find out. Um, 30, 30 hopefully. seconds per slide. There you go. So hi, everyone. My name is Maureen Pollock. I'm one of the staff planners uh, with the town. And uh, we're here tonight to introduce um, our uh, work of uh, making permanent aspects of Article 14 um, uh, permanent uh, as part of the zoning bylaw. So tonight's uh, outline is going through the background of Article 14, um, the purpose and goals of, of these possible zoning amendments, explore making certain aspects of Article 14 permanent, other zoning bylaw and procedural changes that would be needed, a summary and next steps. Uh, so Article 14 was originally uh, proposed to expedite the permitting of a new and existing retail businesses, restaurants, and personal care establishments to more quickly um, merge from the economic disaster created by COVID-19. Um, since its adoption, Article 14 has been very successful in allowing existing businesses to continue to operate or expand and to allow new businesses to open without having to go through uh, the public hearing process uh, through the ZBA or uh, the planning board as applicable, uh, which can be, you know, uh, lengthy processes and, and um, you know, and has um, costs associated with that. Um, Article 14 has been instrumental in keeping Amherst businesses alive and some even thriving throughout the pandemic. Um, there's been no, no issues have arisen from administrative approval of these permits. And um, there's a lot of interest from, uh, from the business community, from the CRC, and from town staff in making aspects of Article 14 permanent. Um, and so, um, you know, the purpose and goals of, of our forthcoming zoning amendment proposal is to reduce the lengthy and costly, costly permitting requirements for business types that support our downtown and village centers encourage business owners to consider locating and incentivize businesses to consider locating in Amherst, uh, support the Amherst bid and Chamber of Commerce in their efforts, uh, take prior, prior practice and effective procedures of land use review boards and make it into standard con uh, conditions uh, and ensure uh, properly conditioned approvals and to recognize more impactful uses and alterations for continued land use board review. And so, um, you know, so planning staff, where we are, uh, we would like to review the permit path and classification of the existing um, food and drink establishments under the the zoning board uh, under the current zoning bylaw, sorry, and to consider reclassifying these uses um, that are based on uh, intensity of the use, impact of of its surroundings, uh, whether food is served and uh, what is the occupant capacity for these uh, sorts of food and drink establishments under the zoning bylaw, and to consider changes to the standards and conditions for each use type, as well as uh, changes to the permit pathway for these uh, use types to help streamline um, the permitting for less impactful uses, uh, particularly. And so here is a refresher of what what is, um, the different food and drink establishments and their pathways under the existing zoning bylaw. So we have three class types for restaurant, restaurant and drink establishments. There's a class one, which is a restaurant, cafe, uh, lunch room, cafeteria, or similar place. And um, it's allowed by site plan review for new construction and permitted by site plan review waiver requests for redevelopment projects. So for instance, uh, for um, a restaurant that is now unoccupied and a new restaurant wants to come in, as long as they don't need to make exterior changes other than changes to like the window or the doors or the signage, then they could request a site plan review uh, waiver. Um, and then there's a class two restaurant and bar that's allowed by special permit and a class three, which is a drive up restaurant um, that's also allowed by special permit. 
and that would be sort of like um uh, uh literally like a uh, yeah drive up there's no seating inside and a uh, typical example would be um you drive up buy coffee and drive away and but you couldn't go inside to purchase your coffee or sit down inside and there are no known drive up restaurants in Amherst um and so if when i go to the next slide um the um, how those uses uh, class th those uses I just described in the previous slide uh, class one class two and class three they're really based on the following factors our operation whether it's open past eleven thirty whether alcohol is served or not and its proximity to dwellings uh, located in residential zoning districts and that's it there's no other factors um, that define those three those three uses. Um, and so we would like to propose uh, to consider um, reclassifying those said uses based on uh, the intensity of the use, queuing, noise, as well as whether food is served or not, um, the, and uh, capacity of, of the occupants allowed at any given time. And so um, we, you'll see, so with these these bullets here, um, we would want to, um, the first one that we what we are considering to reclassify would be, um, you know, a restaurant or a bar with food, uh, food uh, and um, so food, uh, the food menu would be available at all times. And so that would be one use. Um, and then we would also like to further consider um, um, creating a new use for very small establishments in existing buildings. So restaurants with food, uh, in existing buildings, such as um, uh, that have maybe 20 seats or less. And we're still working, uh, considering what that sweet spot of, of the amount of seats is, if 20 or maybe a little bit more would be appropriate. And, you know, the types of examples of existing restaurants that come to mind that would fit that would be like MoMA's, the Tibetan restaurant, or Pita Pocket, or Lily's restaurant. Um, they're all very small restaurants and you know they already have a kitchen inside um and uh, they're ready they're ready to go um in, in case a new restaurant would like to come in and so you know we would want to consider um making it uh, another use for that and seeing if we can make that buy right for instance um to really help promote small restaurants and businesses and, and incentivize those restaurants to come to Amherst, particularly for these very small uh, very small spaces or or restaurants. And then the other use type that we're uh, propose, uh, considering would be a bar with no food served, um, serves drinks, you know, alcohol only, and only with minimal prepackaged food or allows uh, take-in food. Um, and so some examples of that that currently exist are is like the Moan and Dove. They, there's, um, they provide peanuts. Uh, the Drake provides back popcorn, and the Spoke uh, you can bring takeout food, and um, and that requirement is actually about providing minimal prepackaged food or or takeout is a requirement of the Amherst Licensing Board. So we would want to sort of keep or be complementary to their to the licensing board's continued uh, requirement. So that that was the mention um, why the minimal prepackaged food would be a requirement, and then a nightclub as defined by the building code and some classic sort of fa uh, you know um, characteristics of a nightclub would be low lighting levels, loud music, dense amount of occupants, probably standing and dancing, um, and there probably wouldn't be tables or maybe you know, very minimal amount of tables, and then there would be door opening times. Um, that, you know, the majority of people come in at the beginning of the night and the majority of, of people leave at the end of the night. Um, and the last use we're considering is any of the above food and, and drink establishments with more than 250 occupants allowed. So they, those would be for larger sort of scale, larger capacity restaurants. Um, we would want to um, have maybe particular considerations and conditions for those uh, for larger capacity um, um, venues. And then the next slide is to consider changes to the standards and conditions for each of those pr uh, proposed use types. So this, the current standards and condition, con conditions under the zoning bylaw for 
for food and drink establishments are very limiting and um and they could be completely expanded to make the process more clear predictable coordinated and timely you know the zba the planning board and the building commissioner have gradually built a set of effective uh, boiler plate conditions as part of the approved permit um, and staff would like to review those boiler plate conditions and re recommend incorporating them into formalized standards and conditions under each proposed uh, use. And, um, you know, this approach has been implemented successfully for several years. Uh, we've built, you know, I I've been working with the Zoning Board of Appeals here in Amherst for, for uh, four years. And, you know, we've, you know, gradually have built uh, these these standard conditions or boiler plate conditions for restaurants and they keep on getting tweaked in 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 um, a more precise and um, they've been really effective. And this approach, you know, was sort of um, the same approach that we dealt with the recently approved accessory dwelling units. The Zoning Board of Appeals has uh, approved many of many um, ADUs or they were once called accessory. I forget what they were called before. Oh, supplemental dwelling units. And so the ZBA, you know, were imposing um, these conditions on a routine basis and that we're working effectively with planning staff and enforcement services. And um, and so those those were some of the specific recommendations that are were put into the accessory dwelling unit bylaw um, that um, that were based on ZBA decisions as well as you know co comments from from you know, the CRC and the planning board and members of the public. But th that was was a really effective way of, of working with that zoning amendment proposal last year. And, and that's sort of a similar approach that we would like to um, consider for, for this proposal. And so we'd like to consider allowing uh, restaurants and bars, um, restaurant and bars that serve food to be uh, permitted by site plan review and for smaller uh, restaurants with food in existing buildings with a very low capacity, such as like maybe 20 seats, um, plus or minus that, uh, we would like to explore whether we can make that a buy right use um, to help really encourage and incentivize small business owners to um, come to Amherst into these spaces that are exist and just need um, perhaps some minor adjustments um, to fit their particularly, you know, their particular brand or what have you. Um, and then um, the second use would be a bar with no food served. And, you know, that's a higher capacity uh, or a higher intensity use um, that, you know, may involve noise levels and, and thinking about queuing outside. And so that we would like to suggest that that would be by special permit as well as a uh, nightclub and establishments with more than 250 occupants allowed as those those are uh, becoming higher intensity uses that may have impacts to the surrounding um, properties uh, and what have you and so we would want to allow that by a discretionary special permit uh, with um, specific conditions um, for that particular development and so there would be, as part of this work here, we would need to uh, explore other zoning bylaw and procedural changes, um, such as amending Article 11 to detail the administrative approval decision and to consider how to publicly post administrative applications and associated uh, decision, decisions. Um, you know, a great way, uh, I think, that could be effective is utilizing our new permitting system, which is uh, called OpenGov, and I think members of the public can currently log on to that and, um, and see what permits have been filed with the town and, and look at decisions. So using existing technology to be more transparent for members of the public and to utilize our the town of Amherst website and using, so using those both together uh, as a way to to um, educate and inform the members of the public about about um, you know applications and decisions in general, uh, but here in particular for for um, these zoning amendments proposals, and to um, explore Article Five accessory uses can, um, such as seasonal outdoor dining and live or pre-recorded entertainment. Uh, we would want to explore that as well as uh, with this project um, and see how um, those could uh, be consistent with the proposed permit path for 
um, these you know, restaurants and bars. Um, so we'd like to explore that. And then um, let's see here. Um, so in summary, um, you know, Article 14 has made it clear that that more uses could be permit could be permitted successfully either administratively or by site plan review. It's important to note that Article 14 does expire in six months. It expires at the end of December of this year. Um, and this is a great opportunity to improve um, the permitting process for you know, restaurants. And uh, Amherst's uh, lar large student population and recent development will continue to support these establishments in, in our downtown and village centers um, close to residential areas. And so we're trying to find balance in having reasonable oversight into high den intensity uses such as bars with no food and nightclubs and to support economic development in our downtown and, and village center. Um, so, you know, making, you know, sm you know smaller restaurants, um, you know, be uh, approved by site plan review or ec extra small be approved by, uh, by right if possible. And so, um, you know, we would like to receive feedback from you. We, re we presented this exact presentation last week at last week's CRC meeting. And um, they gave us positive feedback uh, about this proposal. And um, their only suggestion was for staff was to also consider proposing new temporary uses such as like special events, such as like weddings and cheese tastings and seminars and art and craft pop-ups. Um, there currently is no um, permit pathway for those types of things. So unless a special permit or site plan review specifically says this farm can have weddings or this, um, this you know, grocery store can have cheese tastings, uh, for example, um, there is no permit pathway. And so we would like to provide opportunities for for um, for you know pop-up events um, that are you know that are well managed and um, are offered maybe you know a few times a year um, and to explore what kind of permitting would that be required and um, and look at all kinds of factors. We could talk about that at a future meeting. And then we would also um, need to draft proposed changes to um, section 3.3. .3. That's where all the uses are um, are provided in, in the zoning bylaw and in those standards and to draft minor related amendments to article five, which is for accessory uses as well as article 11, which is regarding administrative approvals. And we would like to ideally return back to both the CRC and to hear the planning board with draft amendments in early September. And so I uh, thank you and uh, please let us know what you think. Okay, thank you, Maureen. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, was this exact presentation in our packet? Yes, it was. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I knew there was at least some of it in there. All right. So do you want us to put this on an agenda for a meeting before early September or, yeah. uh, or not? I guess if you, can... want to, if you want to discuss it, you could. Um, you're probably yeah. all too tired to discuss it now. But... Yeah, I, I don't think we want to discuss it now. Uh, board members, based on what you've seen, do you want to discuss this or do, should we just wait till September when Maureen comes back with some actual proposals? I'm inclined to wait till September myself. One thing you could do is um, if you have particular suggestions based on the, what was in your packet or what you saw tonight, you can email me or Maureen or Nate with your suggestions and we could incorporate those. Okay. Um, and will this material be shared with our two new members? We can do that. I think one of whom has been attending this evening, but mm -hmm. uh, looks like, yeah, he's still here. So, uh, all right, thank you, Maureen. Good work. All right, so the time now is 1023. Is that the end of new business, Chris? Yes, yep. Mm -hmm. All right, well, are there any other ANRs? No, no. How about CBA <clears throat> applications? Anything we need to know about? 
There is one new one that I was made aware of. Let's see. We should have asked Maureen to stay. So this application is going to go before the ZBA on July 14th. This is 485 Pine Street, which apparently for a very long time, like around 40 years, has been used as a two family residence. Um, however, there is no official record of permitting for a multifamily. Um, so it is being presumed to be a pre-existing non-conformance. Uh, currently, this property is under agreement to sell. So they are looking to rectify the, um, the lack of a permit. So a duplex is allowed in the RN zone by special permit. So that is what this applicant is seeking. Here is the property at 485. There would be no changes um, other than to do some remodeling to the building, but my understanding is, is that there is not gonna be any changes. All right, thank you, Pam. You are welcome. I, I personally don't see the need for this to come to us. I see Tom shaking his head in agreement, essentially. Uh, so unless anybody raises their hands, why don't we consider, uh, you know, we'll let that one go. Okay, uh, any upcoming SPP, SPR, SUBs? Uh, we did receive an application um, from Archipelago for a building up on Olympia Drive. We received beginnings of the application back in March, but um, this past week they kind of completed the application. So you'll probably be seeing that sometime in August, I'm guessing early August, which would be August 3rd. And that's for a, I think it's 65 units of a, what do they call it? An apartment style dormitory. And it's similar to the building that's already up there on Olympia Drive. It's just, it's different architectural um, style, but it's, I think it, it's a nice development. Okay, thank you. All right, planning board committee and liaison reports. Jack is absent. Um, Andrew, anything on CPAC? I can't remember the last time that I know I missed uh, a meeting, but um, the, did I mention that the high school track had come before the committee yet? If not, I'll just say that they did. And uh, the, the committee uh, voted in favor of supporting that uh, request for, I believe it was $800,000 uh, or, or very close to that number. Um, the only other update I have, I know we have some new folks coming on. It's just, um, I've been contacted asking about planning board representation on CPAC. So uh, I suspect with new members, we might you know, look to, uh, to, to reevaluate where people are going, but just put it out there that, that we have that decision to make. That's it. Yep. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Tom, anything on DRB? No, we have a meeting coming up in the next week or so. All right. Janet is absent. Chris, anything for CRC you want to tell us? Oh, just that the CRC spent quite a bit of time reviewing um, Maureen's presentation, and they were very enthusiastic and supportive of the direction that we're moving in. So, okay. All right, um, report of chair. Um, I guess I have two items. First is, Maria, I really wanna thank you for being on the committee. I think we're really gonna, I'm gonna really miss you and I think we all will. Uh, I have the same thing to say to Jack, but he's not here to hear it. Um, so thank you for your service. Thank you, Doug, for carrying the torch. This is not an easy task you're doing. You're doing fantastic. So thank you, Doug. And, and thank you to all the board volunteering your time. I know how valuable time it is. I just thank you so much for volunteering and continuing the good work. <laughs> so I hope, you, I hope you drop in and give us public comments now and then. Uh, uh, they go until 1030 at night. I don't know. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And thank you, Chris and Sam. You guys have un undying patience and energy and Nate as well. You guys are, you have the hardest job. I know I can't.
kit. Yeah, thank you enough for all your uh -huh. incredible work too. <sighs> all right, well, good luck. I'm so sad. All right, and I guess the other thing I wanted to, to ask Chris was uh, we're gonna need to vote in new officers and make new committee assignments. Uh, do you think it, we should try to do that right, you know, early in, at our next meeting in July, or should we wait a month or six weeks and, you know, have, have the vote after we've been together a little while? Uh, in your experience, is there any pro or con either direction? Um, no, there isn't really. Um, I, I guess I would suggest to wait until um, maybe your second meeting in August, um, because then you will have been together for July 20th, August 3rd, and August 17th. Mm -hmm. And that might be a good night to have um, the elections and reorganization if that suits everybody. Oh, although I think some of you are not going to be here on the 17th. Tom, is that right? Is not. And maybe Johanna. So maybe we could do it on August 3rd instead. All right. So maybe maybe at our next meeting, I'll just ask when people are going to be absent uh, between now or between then and uh, the first meeting in September. Mm -hmm. And, and we'll we can, see yeah. what makes sense. Okay, so that's really all I had. Uh, Chris, you have any report of staff? No, I just wanted to thank Maria and say what a great um, person she's been to work with on the planning board. She's been a faithful attender of um, site visits and faithfully signing decisions and faithfully attending the planning board meetings and giving good comments and just being really, really a good person to work with. So thank you so much, Maria. And um, we'll miss you, but I hope we'll see you around town. Okay. All right. The time is 1030. And I, unless anybody wants to prolong this, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank everyone. you for, thank thank you for you. sticking with it. All, all Bye, -bye. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye, Maria. Bye, Maria. Thank you. Bye. Best of luck, everyone. Bye. Thanks for all your service. Bye. Bye. Good night, Mr. Marshall. Good night, Pam. See you soon.